So hello, good morning and welcome again. Welcome to day two of Code Dive 2019. How is everybody? Okay, yeah, that's a pretty good enthusiasm. Uh, for those who uh, haven't had a chance uh, to meet me and for whom I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Rafał Motriuk. I'm a science and technology journalist, also a lecturer at our local SVPS University and also co-owner of Intercom, a training communications company. I'll be your host today, the whole day here on uh, stage one. How was the middle party last night? No, no, actually, don't tell me. I can already see it in your faces, and your faces tell me it was very, very successful. Um, just a quick uh, reminder, uh, th there is this person for whom we've been uh, collecting donations, so it's a charity cause. If you go to our website, there's a button that you can click and donate some money. This is for this person whose name is David, David and uh, he's a person with a disability. He recently got a training at Nokia and he would like to continue working for the company, but the thing is that he needs some funds for his transportation systems. So if you'd like to support David, please go on our website, click the button and donate uh, any funds that you can. And chances are David will be visiting us uh, later today. Also, you may remember that in previous editions of CodeDive, we used to play this game of Nokia words. So these, the, these were the words that we used to uh, collect and they are specific to Nokia or unique to Nokia. And I thought that maybe this year we'll do something slightly different. So I'd like to check how much you remember from those words. So how about this year, I'll give the definition and I ask the room if you can remember what the word is. So the first definition today is, what do you call a place of creative meetings, technology, knowledge and business? And you can go there, pitch your idea, get help from experts, and use local tools and make your dreams come true. Nokia Garage, thank you very much. It's actually operational here in Wrocław and in some other locations. So just for everybody to remember, Nokia Garage. That's it, thank you very much. More coming up, but uh, before that, let me introduce our first speaker today, and his name is Viktor Ciura. Viktor is a principal engineer at Kafion, technical lead on the advanced installer team and a Microsoft MVP. Uh, when he's not pestering his colleagues about modern C++ style, he likes to build uh, tools that improve developer workflows, and he also frequently uses his alma mater, his university, which is the University of Craiova in Romania, and uh, there he teaches students algorithms. And his talk today is called A Short Lifespan for a Regular Mess. Let's have a big hand for Victor Chura. Okay. Thank you. Are we on? Yeah. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm glad some of you are still here after last night's party. Uh, so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about uh, regular types. We're going to do a case study on span. We're going to see some uh, problems that may arise when designing types. and. We're going to see some mistakes that have been made along the way by very smart people. And we'll see what we can learn from all of this. Uh, who has seen any of my previous talks on uh, regular types? I see some hands. OK. So we will start by doing a short intro and overview of the th theoretical principles behind um, regular type design and why this is important when designing types and when consuming library facilities, for example, the standard template library in C++. So this talk is not just about regular types. It's actually a um, moment to reflect on STL and its design principles, as they were stated by Alexander Stepanov in his now 21-year-old paper on fundamentals of generic programming. We shall see that regular types uh, naturally appear as necessary uh, foundational concepts and building blocks when we try to investigate the requirements that we need to impose on types uh, 
uh, when we're using algorithms and STL data structures. But we're not going to talk just by re about regular types. We're going to talk about values, about objects, not as in object-oriented programming, or rather as objects residing in computer memory, about concepts, about ordering relations, and we shall see that there are tricky bits there, about requirements on, f on uh, types, about equality, and we're going to see that defining equality is not as easy as uh, one might think, whole part semantics, about object lifetimes. We're going to use span as a premier example uh, from C++20. We're going to talk about C++, C++ core guidelines, uh, C++17, 20, and things coming up next. So there's lots of things to cover. But, and we, uh, we're going to pick just a s uh, certain parts for of each um, of those um, topics and analyze some aspects that are relevant to this discussion. Uh, I do recommend that you watch this talk by Titus Winters from um, uh, CPPCon. Uh, I'm guessing some of you already seen it. Uh, it's about type properties and type families and how we can uh, properly describe uh, the properties of uh, types and how we can uh, build um, uh, type hierarchies and do overloads uh, properly for uh, our functions and our APIs. But let's start with the beginning, like 2000 years um, BC. And we're going to take an algorithmic journey. And I do recommend this uh, fantastic series of lectures by Alexander Stepanov that he gave at A9. Uh, it's basically a, a story that follows 4,000 years of mathematics, starting with uh, ancient Egyptians and uh, uh, Egyptian multiplication and GCD, and following the mathematical evolution and human understanding of uh, logic and mathematical constructs, and how we've refined these uh, formalisms to, def to properly um, describe um, properties of types and numbers. So th there's a lot of cov to cover there, a lot of hours of video. But for those of you who are mathematically inclined, it's a very interesting journey. Um, a, more sh a shorter version of that would be this book, uh, again by Alexander Stepanov and Daniel Rose, From the Mathematics of to Generic Programming. And it basically, it's the same journey uh, with I implementations, uh, Theorems, lemmas, proofs, um, mathematical histories, uh, tip bits, and it's it's a very enjoyable story to follow. I, it's one of my favorite books. Books I had to put it in there. But in the beginning, there was just zeros and ones, and we sh we need to define a common vocabulary so we can um, properly discuss these concepts. And I'm gonna give a brief definition of these um, uh, terms. Uh, from elements of programming. So a datum is a series of zeros and ones, and they can res represent anything. They have no meaning. A value type is the correspondence between a species and a set of datums. A value is a datum together with it, its interpretation function. For example, a 32-bit integers uh, in big endian representation is a value. And most importantly, and not everybody gets this, values cannot change. Values are immutable. N the number five cannot change. So when we talk about value types and equality, if a value is uniquely represented, because a, a value can be represented differently in computer memory, then equality implies representational equality. That seems obvious. If a value type is not ambiguous, representation equality means equality, if we define it uh, properly. So an object is a representation of a concrete entity as a value in computer memory, given by its address and length. An object has a state that is the value of that type. And of course, the state of, the, of an object can change in memory. So this is what people usually think about when they think about values. These are objects in computer memory. 
A type is a set of values that same, share the same interpretation function that operates on those values. And a concept is a collection of similar types. Everything I just described is from elements of programming. Uh, if you don't have this book, you really should. I consider it a, fundama uh, a, a fundamental book for our uh, science. It's not an easy book. It's the kind of book that you keep on your desk and keep reading from it. Uh, it's available in PDF format, and it's free from the official website there. Or you can, I, th I think you can still order it from Amazon, but it's, uh, it's not in reprint anymore. So mathematics really does matter, I claim. And another very less known, uh, it's a less known uh, video of, uh, by Alexander Stepanov from uh, Smart Friends U describes the GCD algorithm and its evolution over, over well over 2,000 years. And it's a very interesting refinement of this algorithm with implementation details. And I, I do think some of you will find it very, very entertaining. But you may say, I've been programming for many years now, and I didn't need any mathematics to do that. I'll be just fine, thank you. I don't need this nonsense. Well, first of all, I don't really believe you. And the reason that things just worked for you is be because others have thought long and hard to design libraries that feel natural and intuitive to you. So. Uh, you may not have consciously thought about that, but you were unconsciously consuming concepts defined by others. And we shall see that if you're, you break those assumptions, you will have surprises when using these facilities. So 4,000 years of mathematics leads up to fundamentals of generic programming, the thing we started with. And I'm going to just lift some important quotes from this paper because I know not all of you will be inclined to read it. It's not a long paper, though. Generic programming depends on the composition of programs into components which may be developed separately, combined arbitrarily, subject only to well-defined interfaces. And I think this pretty much defines programming as a, as a discipline, regardless of the programming language you choose. Among the interf interfaces of interest, the most pervasively and unconsciously used are the fundamental operators, operations common to all built-in types, like numbers, that extend to user-defined types, like copy constructors and assignment and equality. So we shall see that we have to m meet the expectations of the, the user when defining our own types so that they don't behave strange Equality means equality. We must investigate the relations which must hold among these operations to preverse, preserve consistency with their semantics. So we don't want to define uh, an ordering relation uh, which does not make sense if we model something from the real world. In other words, we want a foundation powerful enough to support any sophisticated programming tasks, but simple and intuitive to reason about. Is simplicity a good goal? Are we C++ programmers or not? Well, uh, I really hate it when uh, C++ programmers brag about uh, being able to grok and understand some obscure uh, language syntax or some really, really clever template tricks. I do claim that simplicity is important for all of us. And being able to reason about a piece of code, uh, whether you're an expert or a beginner, is a, is a sign of proper design. We should not be, be proud to understand really clever stuff. Stuff should be simple. If you're reading the original 21-year-old paper by Alexander Stepanov, uh, might prove a little bit um, tedious for some of you. I do recommend a um, more recent um, take on that, uh, again by Titus Winters. It's a relatively short article on the AppSail blog on revisiting regular types. And basically, uh, it's the, the most recent take on the original Alexander Stepanov paper. And it evokes the Anna Karenina principle for designing C++ types, in the sense that good types are all alike. Every poorly designed type is poorly designed in its own way, its own unique way. <laughs> so uh, there's a, there are horrible stories there. So it's a very interesting uh, article. I do recommend that you read it. 
and it does cover newer concepts in the language and in the library. So it's a, it's a very fresh take uh, on um, regular types. If you're interested, I do recommend that you start with this one and then go to the original Stepan of paper. So it examines how regular type design affects non-value types, because for value types, it seems like it's uh, almost uh, seamless and provides the basis to discussions about newer additions to the library, uh, like string view and span, and how we can use them and leverage uh, this functionality without disregarding completely regular type design. But let's go back to the roots, STL and its design principles. I think this is the, the first uh, available, still available recording of stating the, the manifesto or the uh, design principles of STL. It's the, from the early uh, 2000s, uh, a lecture by Alexander Stepanov. Uh, it's a bit lengthier, but it's, I, I think it's full of uh, interesting um, uh, details that you might not know of. Just a little uh, small things I, I draw from that uh, lecture. S STL is about systematically identifying and organizing useful algorithms in data structures. It seems obvious now. It wasn't uh, over 20 years ago. Finding the most general representation of algorithms using whole part object semantics for data structures, using abstractions of addresses, you know, about iterators, now we're going to have ranges as a, a glue between algorithms and data structures are, that we're using. And algorithms are associated with a set of common properties of types and operations. For example, if we take uh, addition, multiplication, mean, or max, these are all associative operations, so we can reorder operands, and hence we can parallelize the operations, and we can use uh, algorithms such as accumulate or transform reduce or uh, basically uh, re paralyze and reduce the operations for any operation that's uh, associative like this. So this is a natural extension of 4,000 years of mathematics, like I said. And a fundamental insight is that there is an algorithm behind every while and for loop. We've, we've heard that many times by now, but this is a, at the core of STL. STL data structures extend the semantics of C structures as in terms of layout in memory. They don't behave differently. Two objects should never intersect. They are separate entities, and they should have separate lifetimes. This is the thing that uh, we usually don't respect when designing types, and we do have intricacies and um, weird relationships between our types and their uh, our understanding when we're analyzing a complex system in terms of lifespan and uh, how objects relate to each other, it's all very often very difficult because we forget about this thing and we design very complex relationships within our objects. We should try not to do that. It's not always easy, but... Um, when you copy the whole, you copy its parts, whole part semantics, when the whole is destroyed, all parts should be destroyed. Think about remote parts now. Think about uh, we, uh, how we design uh, structures that have pointers to other things. So we often break this rule. And two things should be equal if they have the same number of parts and their corresponding parts are equal. This one seems obvious. Again, it's not something that we do regularly. Generic programming does have its drawbacks. You rarely have some extraction penalty. Uh, you have the implementation in the interface because we, we're talking about templates. We have early binding, horrible error messages, like we all know, uh, duck typing, and unexpected results down the line. Things might work now for the types we're using today and might break in the future uh, when we're introducing new types into, into, into the mix. So we need to fully specify requirements on types in order to um, make sure that the algorithms we provide work with uh, the types we intended, not by chance. We don't want duck typing. S some examples of named requirements 
are here on the on the screen. There are mo lots more of them. I just picked uh, some more frequent ones, and we're going to focus uh, on a few of them. Named requirements are used in the normative text of the C++ standard to define expectations of the standard library, so that you know if you're using so the sort algorithm, what's the expectations, for example, for the type you're uh, sorting in some particular collection, or for the predicate you provide, if you provide a custom predicate for your sort algorithm. So some of these requirements are being formalized as C++20 concepts. But until then, until you're on C++20, and even then, the burden is on us to ensure that library templates are instantiated with the proper types, and that we know what, you, what we're doing. Yeah, with concepts, we're going to get better diagnostics when compiling and misbehaving, misusing a particular algorithm. But uh, again, we need to understand why we're getting that diagnostic. It might be prettier but we still have to understand why we have that requirement. So what is a concept anyway? It's a formal specification uh, that allows us to verify that the, template, that the template arguments provided meet the expectations of the template during overload resolution and template specialization, not within the template body when the, the code is actually uh, used. So each concept is basically a predicate uh, that is evaluated at compile time, and it's part of the interface of that uh, function template. Some examples, again, of concepts from C++20. Uh, right, now, right now, I'm going to just rant. <laughs> uh, I, it was relatively recently, it was decided to switch to uh, uh, snake case notation, so lowercase snake case notation, notation for concepts. I pre personally prefer the Pascal case, um, and I'm going to tell you why. So I, I think the people just lack imagination here. I like the original Pascal notation that has been in the proposal for many years now, because I think as a new thing and a very strange idea for C++, Concepts need to stand out. They are policies rather than types. And because they're not types, I, th I don't think they should be easily uh, confused with standard types that use the snake case notation. And I think consistency with template parameters, as they're usually uh, used by everybody in Pascal notation, is again desirable because they're going to come in as replacements for those uh, specific types or uh, type names. So, for example, this is how we define uh, a basic string. And the most awful thing, I think, is the confusion with type traits. Uh, we have here an example of a type trait and a concept, and I dare you to tell me which one is which. And they don't mean the exact same thing. This is the most weird thing. Okay, so end of rant there. So what's the practical upside? Uh, if I'm not a library developer, why do I care? Um, well, for sure you're using, or I hope you do, STL algorithms and data structures. So designing and exposing your own vocabulary types when you design a library or when you provide an interface for some functionality that you implement, again, you need to meet the expectations of the programmers that are consuming the, those things you're designing. Uh, they should behave like the other libraries that they've seen, and the most prominent one is the STL. So uh, if you're designing something that behaves very strangely or very differently from, the, from STL, then people are going to have surprises. Let's speak uh, on one example, the compare concept. And I'm going to pick the sort algorithms, algorithm because it's the most frequently used, I think. What are the requirements of the compare type? So the compare is basically a function object that is a predicate because it returns a Boolean value. And it's a binary predicate because it takes two parameters. Pretty simple. It should look like that. But what kind of ordering relations relation is needed for elements of the collection in order for this kind of predicate to work with the sort algorithm? So I do have 
a whole talk where I analyze this in depth and the gotchas required, uh, the gotchas attached to this problem when defining a proper con uh, ordering for a compare concept. Uh, bottom line is we need strict weak ordering. The STL expects that from our types. And this would be the axioms that guarantee that we we're not violating this requirement of strict weak ordering. And I'm going to draw your attention to uh, the equivalence relations. The equivalence relations is when we cannot say if A goes before B or B goes before A. In that situation, we're saying that it's, it's an equivalence relation with regards to that, uh, those uh, values. Less than the comparable is a, a particular instance of strict weak ordering where the operation is less than. That's just it. I just replaced uh, generic comparator with less than. And again, we have the equivalence relation. Named requirements. Uh, we're going to focus now on equality comparable concept. As defined, semi-regular is something that is default constructable, uh, movable or copyable, move assignable or copy assignable, swappable and destructible. Most types kind of fell, in, uh, if fell into this category. And regular, as in uh, defined in uh, elements of programming, is a semi-regular type that is equality comparable. And we shall see what that implies. STL is assumes uh, equality is always defined, or at least an equivalence relations, like we, s we saw when we presented the axioms. So STL arguments assume regular types. STL containers assume regular types are stored in them. And I it was clearly designed with like re regularity as its basis. So we, if we do not understand these concepts, we're not going to be able to use it properly. Equality comparable is defined by three axioms, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. This is something we learned early on in school. And types must provide an, op an equality operator, and sh it should have standard semantics. We, we don't want to change the meaning of equality for our type. We cannot make it mean something else. And for types that are both equality comparable and less than comparable, STL makes a distinction between equality and equivalence, and it's sometimes subtle. And uh, we sometimes do weird things around this area. Uh, and of course, equality is just a special case of equivalence. Um, and this is how it should be defined. Defining equality is really, really hard. Doesn't seem so, but it is. Um, I'm going to quote again Stepanov. Two objects are equal if their corresponding parts are equal, applied recursively, including remote parts, but not comparing their addresses, excluding inessential components, and excluding components which identify related objects. Phew. And this is not a complete definition. So weird corner cases everywhere. Uh, I have to point out the new addition to the C++ standard, the three-way uh, comparison, because it's related to uh, what we discussed, ordering relations. And we have this, the so-called spaceship operator, and that uh, defines uh, basically ordering relations between uh, values of types. And we have several ordering uh, categories or ways of defining the strength of the relationship, of the ordering relation. Um, I, won't, I don't have time to go into details, but I'm going to point you to a, a very good talk about that. And we have a contention here in defining this operator for types, or even for library types, uh, because we want the convenience of this operator, so we don't want to write six different operators less than, greater than, less than, equal than. Uh, and at the same time, we have the problem of implementing this uh, efficiently for wrapper types, uh, like the example I'm pointing out here. So if we have like a, a member that is a collection, and there's a, this contention about doing e equality comparison 
efficiently and doing the, the implementing the three-way comparison generically. So uh, we might need to split this implementation into a, a generic comparison and treat equality and respectively inequality separately, just to preserve efficiency. So there's a tension there. Uh, the mothership has landed. This operator uh, has been implemented throughout the STL. So we're, we're going to get it for <coughs> most of the uh, data structures in the standard library. And this is the talk I referenced earlier. If you want to learn more about three-way comparison, I'd recommend this talk by uh, Jonathan Hüller. It's a very recent one, so it's very relevant still, because this design uh, was in evolution. But before we get too far with C++ 20 stuff, uh, let's examine a bit uh, an interesting C++ 17 type. Uh, I think this one is much more familiar to many of you. String view is an object that can refer to a constant continuous sequence of care-like uh, objects. And it does not manage its storage. The storage is up to the uh, user. Again. I have a whole talk just about string view and gotchas and best practices in using it and what it entails and what can you do with tooling to help you there. Uh, I'm going to just summarize some of the important bits here because they're relevant to discussion uh, further on when we tackle span. Uh, string view is the borrow type. Um, I think Arthur borrowed this term from the Rust community where they have the borrow checker for ownership checking. And succeeds, String Viewer succeeds um, admirably at the goal. This is, this would, it was designed for this, to be a drop in replacement for a constraint graph. And the problem here is that this is the first mainstream uh, borrow type in uh, the standard library. So this is why uh, it's attractive to um, many um, programmers. So that's why we need to pay attention to it and understand how to use it properly. Up until then, uh, up until now, we had value types and reference types, and we knew how to deal with those. This is a weirder new kind of uh, type. Uh, that's why we have this term for it, borrow type. It's it it wants to look like a value, but it behaves like a reference. So it's a strange thing. Um, so it's essentially a borrowed reference to an existing object. They lack ownership. They should be short-lived. All borrow types should be short-lived. They can generally do without an assignment operator, but we shall see that it's not always the case, like it's for string view. Um, they generally appear only in function parameters list, and this should be the takeaway. This would be the safest point to use them. And they cannot be safely stored in data structures or returned from functions. So we have to be very careful there. But string view is assignable. So you can do that because it's convenient. But assignment has shallow semantics. So the, this works because the underlying strings are immutable. So they cannot change from under you. Meanwhile, comparison, because we talked about equality earlier, comparison has deep semantics, because when we're comparing two strings view, we want the lexicographic compare of the underlying buffer that we're, s we're using, we're seeing through this string view. So again, we have to be careful here. But things work because the underlying thing is immutable. So when the underlying data or buffer is extant, alive, and constant, we can determine whether the, r the usage we're seeing looks regular. When used properly, and this would be the, the recommendation in function parameters, string view works well as if it's a regular type. It's obviously not a regular type as per the Stepanov definition, but it kind of behaves well when used in this restricted context. So uh, it's safe and it's convenient. I wouldn't discourage people from using it. It's definitely efficient. So not great, not terrible, but we shall see that things get worse with span. So I'll give you C++ 20 span, which is a very confusing type and has been the subject of discussion for many months now, um, maybe years. Um, 
within a C++ committee. Think of it as in array view, just like string view is, but the underlying data is mutable. It's not constant like it was with string view. Uh, this is necessary by design because its intent was to be a replacement for doing pointer arithmetic and basically traversing buffers that we need to change with pointers. So again, it does not manage the storage it refers to. The lifetime management is, for, is up to the user. It stems from the C++ core guidelines. So the origin would be uh, in that original manifesto. Uh, there are uh, particularly two uh, entries in the CPP core guidelines referring to span. Use span to designate a half of a sequence, and I put links there. Uh, I'm going to provide uh, slides uh, right after the talk, so I have plenty of links and references in, uh, in my slide deck. Uh, for those of you who want to dig further on, uh, everything blue there is navigable. And the bound safety profile when we can check out-of-bounds accesses. Um, very briefly, um, informal non-explicit ranges are sources of errors. We all know that. We've all bumped into those. Ranges are extremely frequent. We always deal with ranges uh, by pointer and length, or pair of iterators, or something like that, or two pointers. Uh, but they're typically implicit. And their correct usage is very hard to ensure. It's not built in into some type. It's a convention that we pass a pair of things, and they mean a range, like a pointer and a length, or a two pointers, or pointer and something that we know it ends with a null, or something like that for strings, for example. So it's generally impossible to know if there really are said elements after the address we provide in at the for the beginning of that range. So this is why uh, encoding this information explicitly in a type is useful. But again, span is not bounds checked. So span, standard span uh, comes from the GL cell or the guideline supports library, uh, support library from the GSL span. And its purpose is to codify this information about range and to be efficient. We don't want a high level abstraction that costs something because if we design such a thing, people are not going to use it. They're still going to use pointer arithmetic. So we want something that is efficient. Um, bound safety profile, indexing arrays using constant expressions, no array to pointer decay, the usual stuff we run into. And um, okay, right, Bas the gist of it is be explicit, use span. Um, again, some links to dig into with more examples and details there. So I mentioned the GSL. It introduced span, string span, and owner types. We now recognize those as string view and span. So it's, it's an older design. So from the original uh, paper, now we're going to focus on, uh, on the span proposal, as it's going to land in C++20. The standard span comes directly from the GSL and is intended as a replacement for unsafe pointer and length parameter pairs. And this is the important bit. We expect it to be pervasively used as a vocabulary type for function parameters in particular. So its intent is to see this everywhere you used to see a pointer and length uh, kind of things. So this is why we need to be careful because we, if we start sprinkling span all over the place, and we don't know the gotchas and how to use it, then we're going to have surprises because it's not really bounds checked. So <coughs> uh, I have a link there to the original uh, paper. We ha do have some tooling to help with this. Um, we have CPP core line checkers in Visual Studio 2017 or and 2019. And I think even uh, 2015, there's a NuGet package that you can apply to check for these things and see recommendations. We have LLVM Clang Tidy that has uh, a whole module on CPP core guidelines and checks and recommends such replacements like uh, the bound safety profile and uh, rec recommending using span for um, encoding explicit ranges. 
Um, these would be the checks from Clang Tidy and the details there. Uh, this is how it would look like uh, in Visual Studio. The two, uh, we have the two errors that we, we may see, uh, two warnings that we may see. No pointer to, uh, no array to pointer decay, and don't use pointer arithmetic. Uh, very simple, uh, trivial example there, and you would, uh, you even have a way to suppressing this locally if you don't want to be pestered about this. I'm not a fan of this uh, usage, but you can suppress it locally if you want to. Uh, enable that throughout your project. And this would be the, the experience you would have. Uh, you would start to get suggestions when you're trying, you're trying to do pointer arithmetic things, and you're going to get suggestions to use a span uh, in such places to move the sliding window through your buffer. So this would be the experience you have. As you type or as you browse through code, you're going to see some, some of these tips. Whether you like to change something or not, it's up to you. Again, pointer arithmetic, use span. Some people don't like this, up to you. So span is defined as a pointer and a size, and can have either static extent or dynamic extent, uh, whether depending on how you plan to use it. And you can construct span from in various different ways, and I have dated this slide um, because the information on uh, CPP, um, CPP reference is not up to date yet. Uh, I have updated this slide with the changes from uh, Belfast, uh, the last me uh, committee meeting in November. We, now you have a range constructor for span, and yeah, this was the change from uh, Belfast. You can construct it from a range. So we can construct it from uh, an array, from a standard vector, the, the way we would expect to construct it. It has some convenient functions like front, back, and index operator, and data. has convenient methods to get uh, the contents, the buffer, as bytes. Uh, it's debatable where, whether this is uh, too convenient. <laughs> uh, some people don't like the, the fact that uh, this encourages this reinterpretation of the underlying buffer to uh, bytes. Um, the usual suspects, uh, just as with um, uh, string view, we had convenient things. Um, with span, we have uh, first, uh, last elements. Uh, we can get a subspan, so we can narrow the view into our buffer. And there have been usability improvements in standard span uh, from its original design, and it was refined throughout the versions of uh, Clang was the uh, earliest implementer of this library facility. And from Clang 7, 8, and 9, and now 10, uh, Span has evolved uh, in uh, uh, libc++ uh, following the, um, the evolution of the, um, the paper in the standard, in the soon-to-be standard. Um, so we added front and back functions to improve consistency with uh, con standard library containers, like vector. Uh, empty f uh, method was marked as no discard, just as it is with vector. Um, we lost this uh, f um, operator in parens. This is, was like uh, leftover in the original design because it, uh, initially it was intended to be a multi-dimensional um, thing, this array view. Uh, we now split this proposal. We have a separate proposal for um, multi-dimensional arrays, and that's going to land in the future, maybe 20 C++ 23. Uh, we have stru structured binding support for fixed size spans. And now we have to think about what would Stepanov do if he were to design span. And I think a very, very nice and very succinct uh, paper from Tony Van Erd on uh, should span be regular? And it's, it's an amusing paper to follow, but it has some really uh, deep nuggets of um, knowledge in there. And it does make references to elements of programming, so I liked it. And it talks about overloading operators can be dangerous when you change the common meaning of the operator. We already mentioned that at the very beginning of the talk. 
the meaning of copy construction and copy assignment is to copy the value of the object and remember our definition of the value. Uh, the meaning of equality and less than is to compare the value of the object. Copy, assignment, and equality are expected to go together, just as with built-in types, with integers. Yeah? If we assign something, we expect, when we compare it, to be equal to that thing we assigned it to. And when designing a class type, where possible, we should uh, strive to make it a regular types, a regular type. Let's see how this applies to, to span. Uh, copy operator is shallow because it just copies the pointer and size wi within the, the span. We could make the, the, comp the equality uh, comparator be deep in terms that it compares the, the, the underlying buffer the, or the elements with standard equal. And just like StringView does, we mentioned that StringView does lexicographic compare when we do uh, equality on StringViews. And the initial implementation, the very first implementation uh, in the first draft of the paper was actually this, applying standard equal. It's not anymore. We shall see why. Um, however, StringView can't modify the element it points to because the underlying buffer is immutable. So sh uh, shallow copy for StringView would be like a copy, right, uh, copy on write optimization. So it, it kind of works for StringView, uh, this shallow copy, just as it worked for many years with uh, copy on write string, string implementations. Uh, but is span really a value? Do we need deep compare for spans? Um, span is trying to act like a collection of elements over which it spans. So uh, if we construct a span from a vector, for example, it kind of wants to behave like the vector it spans over. Uh, but it, it really isn't behaving that way. It's not definitely not regular. Basically, ha span has reference semantics. Uh, maybe sh it's debatable if we should call it span ref, but we dropped that long ago. So deep equality implies deep const logical const as to extend this protection to the underlying data. So I w whenever we do deep comp uh, equality comparison, we also want to be consistent and have deep constants. And span cannot guarantee that. All parts of the type that constitute its value, that is, all the parts that we copy when we defined the copy operator, must participate in equality so that we have a consistency. After we assign, we can compare for equality. Deep equality means the value of the span are the elements it spans, not what it's defined in, like the pointer and size. Though, so deep equality would mean that the span, it's not the pointer and size that it's in its data structure. And it, it would mean that the components are the things we construct it from. But it's hard to tie uh, the, the, the span to the original uh, elements because those elements can change. And span has no way of tracking that. So if you want, if you want span to act like a lightweight representation of the elements it refer refers to, we need shallow equality, just like we have for smart pointers when we compare to unique pointers or shared pointers, for example. But shallow const implies shallow equality. So shallow equality might be really confusing. Um, for example, if you're using string view right now, because you can, this might be really, really confusing because uh, it behaves in a certain way for string view. And in your mind, if you take this parallel between string view and span, you think this is for strings, this is for generic buffers. Uh, you might be confused because the equality might behave totally differently for string view and span. So ultimately, the decision, because uh, we, we couldn't settle as a community on a, on a right answer here, ultimately, I think the best decision was to actually remove the equality operator from span. So rather than uh, being confusing, it's at least honest. It does not define an equality. So it's definitely not regular. So it's a strange beast. Um, so 
users of the STL can reasonably expect to use span as a drop-in replacement for standard array or standard vector in cases where it's appropriate and they want efficiency. They want, don't want to copy th vectors for a particular operation if they're visiting those elements. And most of the time, it, it just behaves that way until you, of course, you try to copy or change its value. So then it stops meeting your expectations there. <laughs> So it's definitely not regular. It's semi-regular. So it's a strange beast. Uh, there's an interesting article by uh, Corentin Jabot. Uh, it's an older one, but it's still relevant uh, about span. So no owning reference types like string view or span. For, for these kinds of things, you need contextual information to, to reason about instances of such uh, types. Uh, for example, when you're doing a code review, it's not enough to analyze uh, just the diff, the, just the local usage. You have to understand the, the where the data comes from, what it's it, what it's bind to, to understand the the, the extent of uh, these types like string view and span. So, things you need to consider: shallow copy, shallow deep compare, const mutability, equality operator, things we discussed, uh, and things we. Uh, so from the uh, Tony Van Aert paper. So they have, these types, they have reference semantics clearly, but without the magic that can make references safer. For example, lifetime extension that uh, const references provide, for example. Think about const reference to string. Uh, let's see a very short uh, example here. Uh, for example, we do we have a function that returns a, a temporary string, and we bind it to a const string reference. We've seen this pattern for many years now. This is the C++ 98 thing to do. And this extends the lifetime of the temporary string returned by the function in the lexical scope of that reference, S. If we do the same thing with a string view, ouch, string view does not extend the lifetime of, of the temporary here. And the, the weird thing is, uh, yes, you don't get a compilation error, but even worse, it might actually work. Because uh, if that string implementation has, if most string implementations have more string optimization, then it, will, it might actually work. So <laughs> you might uncover a crash here when the string gets longer. So be very careful about this kind of usage. Um, we do have tooling to help in this regard. So we're not uh, just relying on the compiler itself. So it's good that we have additional tooling, but we do have to remember to use it if we're in doubt, or to use it regularly, and then we see misusages. Uh, there's a bug prone dangling handle, clank tidy check, and checks for such uh, dang dangling references to temporaries. Uh, it's even configurable. Uh, you can provide uh, configuration options for uh, other handle classes that you might have in your code base, things that behave like string view here. The default is for string view. And you can even plug in span there. Uh, check the, that it behaves the, the same way. Detect the same patterns. So uh, we also have the lifetime profile. Uh, the original paper by uh, Herb Sutter is linked here below. Uh, we have this in CPP core guidelines, and the the gist of this um, uh, paper is that it's it's important to prevent common dangling because types like um, we have very natural conversions um, from string to string view, from vector to span, and using it irresponsibly, you almost guarantee dangling references. So that's, we, we na that's why we need to get educated and understand the gotchas, and that's why we need to have tooling that helps diagnose these kind of issues. Um, we had, uh, for over a year now, I think, an experimental flag in Clang that would detect uh, such usage and uh, issue an error here, or a warning, I don't remember exactly. Um, and tell you that, for example, SV is invalidated when the temporary is destroyed on line A. And recently, in uh, Clang 10 or Clang Trunk, uh, we have uh, 
b default built-in diagnostic for this. The, issue, the uh, warning issued is dangling GSL. And it tells us the exact same thing, but in a nicer diagnostic. It tells us that object backing the pointer will be destroyed at the end of the full expression. And the end of the full expression is this semicolon here. So that's why we get warned. And it's nice that we have this uh, built in now. We don't have to rely on, uh, stat on static analysis or, or client tidy check. I'm hoping to see this kind of thing in uh, more compilers turned on by default. And uh, what I'm hoping is to see such a thing extended for uh, span as well. Uh, my understanding is that it's a working progress, uh, and we should expect to see this sometime in the future for span as well. So simple rules for borrow types. Uh, they must appear only as function parameters or loop control variables. If you really, really must make an exception and return such a view, like a string view or a span, the function may use uh, a borrow type to return it, but I, I would encourage you to properly annotate this, document this behavior, so that the caller of that function knows what to expect and if he should take care of the, the, the underlying uh, buffer or take ownership or something. So you definitely don't need to store these. So uh, avoid, sto avoid storing these kind of uh, borrow types in your data structures. Uh, so be explicit. Uh, you can play around with uh, custom attributes. You can actually do this. The compilers will take anything there. So uh, anything you can do to draw attention to unusual uh, patterns, unusual behavior, like returning such uh, uh, views, like span and string view, anything you can do, it will help your colors. Unfortunately, you cannot enforce it. Uh, so that they get a compilation error until we get uh, things like um, the GSL dangling uh, diagnostic that we have in Clang Trunk right now. So be creative. Um, what about compiler support for span? So I don't know if you know this, but there is a, a conformance view, compiler conformance view in uh, Compiler Explorer. And as of November, I updated this slide. Um, these are the compilers that have span included. And I'm going to mention that um, for if you're using Clang, only libc++ has span. It was the early adopter. Lib standard C++ from GCC does not have span yet. So this is the up-to-date uh, conformance. Uh, this would be the evolution. If you were an early adopter uh, from Clang 7, you had span, like bleeding edge stuff. And this is how it evolves. Uh, through the specification, how the specification evolved. Uh, very recently, in uh, the Belfast committee meeting in November, we got a range constructor for span. I have shown that in the uh, CPP reference uh, screenshot where I updated it. Uh, we didn't get it for string view yet. Um, and there's even a proposal, uh, I'm not exactly sure on the state of that one, uh, to use. Um, span of characters as a uh, as stream uh, replacement. So there's work in progress for span, and span-like things. So you should expect more. If you cannot wait and want an implementation of a standard span that matches the current draft of the C++20 standard, and your tooling is not uh, yet uh, shipping such a thing, um, so if you're using Clang 9, you're good. Uh, Alternatively, you can use uh, an open source implementation. Uh, my favorite is the one here by Christian Brindle. It's on GitHub. There is even an implementation of span in the Chromium open source project, and that one is actually bounce checked. Um, I'm not sure if it's configurable. Um, but there are problems. It's not straightforward, uh, at least not if you want a um, uniform usage. So. You're guessing I'm talking about uh, span here as uh, the five phases of joy because it lacks a feature test macro. I don't know how many of you have used feature test macros for other types, uh, for other functionality uh, in STL. But because it lacks a feature test macro and to see if you actually have that implementation in your uh, tool chain, uh, you, you cannot use has include 
uh, for that uh, to check whether you have the span header or not, because um, most implementations, uh, for example, libc++ has all the headers it's implemented and provides the headers, but depending on the standard you're, compli you're compiling with, uh, it might have an empty uh, body, that, that header might be empty. So it is physically on disk, but your compiler, depending on the flags you're compiling with, whether it's C++ 14 or uh, 17, might not have that uh, content. So you cannot use has include for that. And this is important because uh, you don't want an, a span-like thing that it's um, my span. You want it to have the same name and the same API so that when the, the proper C++20 span becomes available for your toolchain, you can just swap the namespace or use the, the standard one, and it just works. You don't have to change anything in your code. So this is why you would bother uh, doing this. But it's not straightforward, unfortunately, because they forgot to provide the feature test macro. Um, I don't know what's your opinion on this little thing, a new kind of main. I, I saw this on the internet. I think somebody tweeted that. Um, I don't remember exactly. And it basically combines two, two of my pet peeves into one glorious disaster. And this is because <laughs> it looks attractive, it certainly is uh, compact, uh, but m like most entry points, uh, like main, you might expect some of those arguments to be passed to some POSIX function or some API that might expect an alternated string. And mind you, string view is not an alternated string. Um, it might be, but it's not guaranteed to be. So beyond span, we do have uh, good things coming. These are higher level abstractions. They come from the ranges proposal. And these, these are things that we're going to get in the future. Things like stride view, uh, slice view, sliding view, cycle view, chunk view. We've seen this in other languages. Uh, some of you might recognize some of these concepts from uh, uh, Haskell or other uh, functional languages. So we're going to get higher level abstractions, but these are uh, different things. Span is meant like an efficient low level solution for a common problem that of formal or uh, implicit ranges. These come as a higher level abstraction that can work over any kind of sequence, whether it's continuous or not. So these these are different beasts, and we don't have them yet. Um, I mentioned earlier we're going to ha have uh, coming down the, the line multidimensional array reference and owning multidimensional uh, array. Uh, these are going to come uh, later in the future, and they're all about defining data layout in memory, and they're useful for um, high performance computing and graphics. But these are concerns for other talks, and they're probably going to come in C++23. My call to action to you would be to make your value types regular. Um, the best regular types are those that build, uh, model built-in types. Think int, think standard vector. So uh, try to model things as close as possible and not to have any dependent preconditions. Try to make things that can uh, make types that can be reasoned about without contextual information. So for non-owning reference types like string view and span, because we're, we have those and we're going to see more of those, and maybe you're designing your own things like those, uh, you need contextual information. We're working that with them. And try, learn from the span uh, story there that I just told, and try to restrict those types to be semi-regular to avoid confusion for your users to meet the expectation. Make your types honest. Don't pretend it's regular and provide some weird behavior uh, about uh, comparing those types and assigning those values. Uh, try to be honest. If, if the usage you are trying to impose on the, on the users of your code looks weird, you better not provide it. So that's about the story of my uh, span. Thank you very much. Victor Chura, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we're really out of time, but perhaps just a quick one or two questions from the audience. And uh, again, the rule is the same as yesterday. So if you'd like to ask a question, please join us here downstairs and pop yours. 
And you're, if you're a little shy, uh, you can always catch me on the hallways later too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Will you be staying later on? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm here all day, so you can catch me later too. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, hi. My colleagues uh, and I always have argument whether types should have a default compari uh, comparison operators. And I say that they shouldn't because it should be explicit about like what kind of relation you want to model. Yeah. Uh, w what is your thoughts on this? Well, uh, you're going to be able to do that with the three-way comparison operator. So y you can define an equal default uh, spaceship operator starting with C++20. Whether that's a good thing for the type you're designing or not, uh, you should be the judge of that. I, I wouldn't consider it uh, a, a good universal practice to provide an equality. I, should, I think you should think about if an equality makes sense for your, for your type. But then, I mean, if the STL requires us to make rigorous types, they, have, they should have it, an equal operator. And is it, is it good that we should always make our types regular then? Oh, uh, this is a different uh, reformulation. Is it something that is desirable? All light types should be regular. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Okay. But I would, I would admit that it's not possible for all types. For example, there are, there are types that you're designing that are not actually values. So they provide some kind of functionality. They have data members, but they have functionality. They, they are actions that perform some transformation. So they, they don't model values. So those kind of things, it, it would be weird I if we would provide an equality for those kind of things. Like a, a class that m manages some kind of state or uh, performs some kind of action. Th that would not be a good candidate for a regular type. It could be, but it's, it, it would be weird because w what does it mean to have a value of a type that has performed some actions? So it's it's not always possible, but, that, but, but for types that you designed are, that have, that represent a value, that it's something that it's, you can check for equality or you can assign it, then it, it better be behave regularly. So Thank you very it much. It very much depends on the type. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, if I may, um, I think it goes, it goes along. Uh, it's more of a comment and asking for an opinion, but uh, I think you did one reckless thing on one of the slides when you presented the mothership operator or the starship operator. Yeah, yeah. And on the uh, when it returns zero, you have written um, or stated that it means that um, what are you comparing is equal uh, slash equivalent. And those are two different things semantically. And I don't think you can uh, say that they are equivalent with that because it's a starship operator. They go uh, in three, so they can only be equal. That's a uh, semantic mismatch, in my opinion. And it resurfaced later on uh, when there was a trouble. And I think it's a trouble that all the scripting language have like uh, identity operator, uh, yeah. triple, triple equality. Yeah, tri yeah. triple equality. Yeah. yeah, so uh, do you think it's a good idea to say that uh, when a spaceship operator returns zero, it means uh, the, uh, the objects are equivalent in terms of identity rather than only equal without comparing their identity? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, Sorry, that's a uh, that's a uh, math question. Basically. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, a di it's a deeper question than that. Whether the 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 equality should be considered like identity, uh, it, it's tough. Uh, think about um, providing uh, such a comparator, for example, uh, for a standard set or for a hash map. Uh, or a hash set implementation. There are several good use cases where you're just very well do with just equivalence. And identity is not a good choice uh, necessarily. So I would, I would be very cautious about generalizing here and that uh, equality should imply identity everywhere. Because there are, there are good cases where you can have an equivalence relations and it really makes sense for what you're comparing there. Um, 
think about, for example, comparing strings case insensitive or comparing um, or building a building a, um, a hash map and just traversing and examining just an important part of the the type you're actually storing, like uh, maybe an, an identifier or a name field or something like that. So like a a, a partial uh, equality, and you consider that to be like uh, this part of my object represents its um, identity in my uh, with regards to my operation. So identity with regards to operation rather to I rather than identity as a whole. Like are these two objects the same object in memory? So uh, identity with regards an op to an operation rather than identity in terms of memory address or a locus on in memory. So I would be very cautious to generalize there. Um, for more uh, things on uh, the spaceship operator, I do encourage you to watch uh, Jonathan Mueller's talk from CPPCon. It's very recent and it goes really in depth. And yeah, I think it's very, very good. I think so we need to leave it at that. Thank you yeah. very much. Please join Thank me you. in thanking Victor Chura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The break is going to be a little shorter. We went slightly over, so do enjoy your break and we'll continue at 10.30, please. 10.30.
So welcome back, thanks for showing up. Just to remind everybody, for those who've uh, just joined, we are still playing the knock your words game this year, but this year it's the reverse kind of order. So you're gonna hear a definition of a word and the task of the room is to guess which word it is. Uh, if it's your first time, uh, the, the game is to collect words that are used specifically by Nokia or for Nokia reasons, and it's just like a little dictionary. So the next word, the definition is, it comes from 5G, which is the, of course, next generation of mobile communications. And the definition of the word is, well, it's a process where basically one wireless base station relays exactly what it hears from another wireless base station in a fast and efficient way. What's the word? Nope. It starts with an S and has four syllables. Let me try again. So one wireless base station relaying exactly what it hears from another wireless base station in a fast and efficient way. Four syllables starts with S. Thank you. You the winner is self back holding, everyone. Self back holding. <laughs> Remember that one? Maybe next year we're gonna have some uh, awards for the winners. So let's move on to our next speaker, and our next speaker is Andreas Fertig. Andreas is a freelance trainer and consultant for C++, specializing in embedded systems. And since his computer science studies in Karlsruhe, he has dealt with the requirements and peculiarities of those embedded systems. He worked for 10 years for uh, Philips Medizin Systeme as a C++ software developer and architect. And he's also involved in the C++ standardization committee, especially in SG14, which deals with embedded systems, obviously. And he develops macOS applications and is the author of cppinsights.io. And the uh, fun fact about Andreas is that although he operates in a very fast moving industry, he still enjoys his 26 year old car. And his friends often ask him when he's going to get a new one. Let me ask you, because you know, we've got a history of German cars being used in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not talking about BMWs. I'm, I'm going back to 26 years ago or more. So let me ask you that 26-year-old car. Is this a Trabant or a Wartburg? No, it's neither. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so th th this is a, a question to be asked later. What is the old car? What is the new one? But in the <coughs> meantime, C++ Lambda's demystified. Andreas Fertig. Thank you, Raphael. Yeah, hello and good morning. I hope you're enjoying Code Dive. I did yesterday. And it's a good thing if you have somebody who introduces you, but it feels odd if you're used to do your own introduction. Um, so I'm Andreas. Hello. You now know that you can hire me for training and for consulting services. So, what can I say about me? What Raphael not under already has said. My last name is a very German name, or a very German word, to be precise. It's an adjective uh, in German. You can translate it as ready, finish, finished, or completed in English. Which is great, because people think that with your name, there comes also a certain completeness of the project. It's not true, I can tell you. It also has some issues because in German the adjective is spelled with a lower first letter while as a name is spelled with a capital first letter. So that makes me constantly arguing with my spell checker whether I'm right or not. Um, we are still discussing who wins that. Sad thing is, and it's okay if you now leave after I'm telling you this, but I have this name since I'm born, so for over 30 years now. And it took me roughly 30 years, a bit more to be fair, to learn 
that I mispronounce my own name. Okay? Because from the part in Germany where I'm coming from, I say it's fertig, with more or less a K at the end, while in proper German it's fertig. And I'm telling this, this story about my name for a long time, and all the time it's, it's possible to collect stories. And the story this time is that Raphael here pronounces my own name better than I do. So, among this and for all the good work Raphael does here, so please give him a hand of applause because he does an incredible job. It is actually very funny because maybe I speak like t five words of German and by this pronunciation I just pretend that I do, which I don't. It's terrific. It's terrific. <laughs> so, okay, maybe it's better if I not talk about my name, uh, more about C++. And this is the evolution of lambdas. Lambdas are the one thing which is um, highly targeted these days in C++ since we got lambdas in the language. If we go through this slide from the left to the right, from the top and to the, but, there, to the bottom, then we can, in C++11, we have in the ankle brackets, for, or in the, yeah, in the ankle brackets first, we have the capture list. We can capture by copy in C++11, by reference, by name, we can capture this. We can capture parameter packs, and we can capture by named reference or named copy. In C++14, that all has increased, we can now also have something which is called init captures. This is the first thing here where I can introduce a new name of a variable I'm capturing inside of the lambda. I can also capture the same system as a reference and not just as a copy. can introduce a new reference name there. We will see examples about this later. And in C++17 there is something which is written star this or dereference this, we will also see what we can do with this. So this just was, was changed or added to the capture list. Next to the capture list we have a block which is empty until C++20 and there you can see the other ankle brackets and the type name or tperms. That's a good hint that now we are also able to have templated lambdas and write different code. We will see examples about this as well. Then in the parentheses, it's essentially a function declaration style. We can with C++11 say we like this lambda to take an int parameter, char or our own class type whatsoever. With C++14 we got something which is until C++20 is not out of the door, still unique because there we can have auto as a parameter type. It's then called the generic lambda. We haven't seen anything like this so far. It will um, be similar with concepts. Next to the parameters of the lambda, we have the specifiers. We can say that our lambda should be mutable. With that, we can change all the copy captured values inside of the lambda. Otherwise, it's const by default. With C++17, there was another enhancement. Lambdas are now implicitly const expert. So if it's possible to do that thing, what you like to do with your lambda at compile time, the compiler enables you to do it by implicitly adding const expert keywords to your lambda. And now is the hardest part. C++20 brings us a new version or new variant um, of const expert. It's called const evil, and because I'm a, not a native speaker, I always hope I pronounce it right, because it's not evil as in something bad, it's evil as in evaluated at compile time. It's guaranteed uh, in comparison to const expert that it will be evaluated at compile time. Then we can add an exception specifier like no except. It was possible with C++11 already, and I had to strike this out uh, with C++20. There was the plan to have contracts there, but unfortunately they were tracked out during the Cologne meeting, so there is no accepts, um, expects or ensures so far, but we are hoping that it will come back with C++23. Then we are seeing the trailing return type. It's optional because by default your Lambda returns an auto type, but if you need or like to specify the return type of a lambda, then you can do so by the trailing return type. And 
In the last column we have with C++20 uh, requires keyword which comes with concepts. I'm always very proud of myself if I manage to par to get them right because the three, twos, coroutines, concepts and contracts. Sometimes I confuse the C's here. Sorry about that, but it worked here. So then below we have in the curly braces the body of the lambda where we can write the functionality we like our lambda to have. And next to that in the parentheses the parameters or the arguments we pass to the function. That's essentially all the different things you can do with your lambdas. Now it's hard for me to see anything, but I've been told that more or less every attendee um, was eligible getting a t-shirt from the conference. And I'm not sure if you looked what's on the shirt you got, if you volunteered for one. It's more or less that code, except for main, but that way it uh, compiles. Question, is that valid C++ code? Just shout out yes or no. Yes, yes. and what does it do? Nothing. It does nothing, and the genius part is it does it by getting downcast to a function pointer, but we will see about this later. But it's valid C++. Let's talk about more, more specific things. Here I have a code fragment which has a const star string and because I rarely have such a huge cinema full of people, so let's do this the proper way. What is the char string spelling here? Hello code dive! Oh, come on, it's early in the morning. Let's do that again. Hello code dive! All right. You're used to watch movies here, I see, I see. So, it prints that string, and after that we, are, we have that string, and after that we have the lambda, which captures by reference, and in its body it has a printf printing out that string. And it's invoked directly afterwards. Let's see what's behind this part of code. As Raphael mentioned in the introduction, I'm also the author or creator of C++ Insights IO. And quick question, who of you has heard about C++ Insights? Just raise your hand. All right, that's great. So for all of those who haven't heard of C++ Insights so far, it's inspired by Matt Godbold's Compiler Explorer. You put in your source code on the left and you get C++ code out on the right. It's brilliant, right? It's an excellent selling point. Putting out C++ code on the left, getting out on the right, million dollar project. So, what happens here is the compiler adds stuff to your source code while creating the AST, while parsing your source code. And what C++ Insights shows you is all the things the compiler adds for us during creating the AST. And if I now transform this code part here from the slide, then we can see, as this talk is about lambda, lambdas, we can see what a compiler creates for us is a class. This is the so-called closure type. This is the reason why we only can capture lambdas with auto, because we don't know the type. And in this case, the name of the lambda is made up because the compiler doesn't bother to create one because it doesn't need to. So that's one statement where you can see that the compiler only does the necessary work and only of that the work that really is required. In this class we can see that the compiler gives us a call operator that would be this method here and in that call operator we find our function body that's what we've written on the left. After that the compiler ensures that what I requested to capture is in this lambda. It's a private member, in my case, is a const jar array of references to that string, size of 18, which matches the size of the string I'm capturing. And then there's, of course, a constructor part constructing that whole thing. And then below there, you can see this is when the lambda is invoked. There directly the call operator is called. This is more or less the magic behind lambdas. And if, it, if you're asking me, 
I really like it. I think it's brilliant. I have the ability to write such less code on the left side. What comes out on the right is what I can also write. It's no magic, but it's just fantastic that I don't have to write all this boilerplate code. I like this. So question for you next. While I developed C++ Insights, um, initially it did a bad job with lambdas. It crashed or did not show all the things. So I spent some time in improving that and I thought about all the ways where lambdas can appear such that I can handle them correctly. This is a very short example. And my question to you is, and it's not related to what you're daily doing, or I'm not encouraging you to change your coding style tomorrow. It's just a fun question. In how many places can lambdas appear in this piece of code if you are not applying them recursively or in each other? Just shout out numbers. Let's say from 0 to 10. 3. We have 3. Do we have something else? 6. Six. 5. five. Oh, yeah, now the countdown is <laughs> broken. Okay. 5, 6, 7, 3. 5 is the correct answer. You can do this. You can, of course, absolutely insane, use a lambda to initialize the variable x. Senseless, I know, but it may have um, more meaning in different contexts. You can use in your for loop for the initializer, use a lambda to just print out something or initialize something once again. You can use a lambda to check whether the loop condition is still valid or not. You can then use a lambda to once again print something out in the post statement of the for loop. And you can have wrapped the printf in the for loop's body into a lambda. It's senseless, but it also shows in how powerful lambdas are because they can appear in so many places, and that's what it makes initially, or the, what it made it initially hard to get them right. So five is the correct answer here. I c uh, so the, the, the question or the, the comment is, I can have a lambda for written main, which you say is missing. A sixth lambda. A sixth I can define main as lambda, you're saying. Okay, I learned something today and I'm giving the talk. Thank you very much. I try this out later. So then six seems to be the correct answer. See, I have to improve. Okay, now about capturing. This is a small piece of code. I have a variable x outside of main, and then inside of main, I have a lambda which pre increments x. And if you're looking closely, you can see multiple things. First of all, this lambda is directly invoked after it's created, and it has an empty capture list. Yet I claim that thing compiles. If you peek behind the scenes once again with C++ Insights, if I do the transformation, if the tool is able to do the transformation, it's a good indication that the code compiles. We can see, okay, we have this closure type below here. Everything is nice and fine. And in fact, there is no private member, but it contains X. And the reason for that is that x, in my example, is a global variable. A global variable is accessible everywhere because it's not static. I can access it from another compilation unit, things like that. And that's where the compiler is just generous with us. There is no need to capture this variable in form of a class member in this lambda because it's accessible anywhere, everywhere. So this is one time where the compiler helps us to write nice code, but also be efficient because 
it would be well not reasonable to create a new member here however there are cases where you like it to be a member because you may like to keep that value at the time you um, created the lambda or invoked the lambda and the interesting part is you cannot easily force the compiler in capturing this in the class. If I say it's a copy capture, I'm capturing compiler still doesn't bother to capture it inside of the lambda. And even if I say capture by reference, which would defeat the purpose, compiler still doesn't do it because it's just more efficient to not do it from that perspective. So as I said, um, with the example on the shirts, lambdas can also be used together with function pointers. In this case, or in that case, you need to use a captureless lambda, then we can assign it to a function pointer. That is interesting if you're dealing with a legacy API where you may like to assign this lambda to, then this gives you the ability. And if you look behind what's happening then, if I do the transformation here, then we can see something we saw on the um, example before. If I have a captureless lambda, as in this case, the compiler creates additional methods in the class for me. This one is what is called a conversion operator, and it returns this underline underline invoke, which is a name the compiler picks. And then I have here this static method inside the class, which is this invoke. It takes two parameters, like I declared it for the lambda itself here, and it contains the same function body as the call operator. And with that, I can assign that thing to a function pointer. I said that's nice when you're dealing with legacy APIs. By the way, if you have any questions, just shout them out. We will somehow manage to get them through. But I can barely see anything after the fourth row or so. Which makes the next part interesting, because I have a question for you. Here I have a main function with three variables in it, A, B, and C. A and C being of type jar, uh, A and C being of type jar, B being of type int. And then I have a lambda which captures everything it uses by copy, and it senselessly uses A, B, and C in that order, just invoking it with a semicolon. It will result in a lot of unused variable warnings in your program if you have a sufficient warning level. But my question to you is, assuming that you're dealing with a 64-bit platform, what is the size of this lambda? Just give me a number. Six. Nine. Okay, count up this time. Sixteen. Eight. Twelve. Thank you. Twelve is the right answer. Through padding rules, which are the same for lambdas as for structs, because it's a class behind it, the size of this lambda due to the arrangement of the variables is 12 on a 64-bit platform. I can influence that if I just reorder the captures. On this slide, it's the same as before, just in the lambda, I'm not saying A, B, and C, I'm now saying A, C, and B. That reduces the size of this lambda down to 8. And because I've been a long time in the embedded industry, I care about such things, even if they're seen tiny. Whenever someone tells you something like this, you probably should ask, is it valid C++? Is it standardized? And this is what the standard says. An implementation may define the closure type differently from what is described below, provided this does not alter the observable behavior of the program, other than by changing the size and alignment of the type. Well, okay. 
you are not allowed to observe the behavior I just shown you. I'm sorry. It works on all the major compilers, but you should not rely on it. For now, it does the job right. I can imagine that in the future compilers may rearrange the variables inside of the closure type more efficiently for such use cases, but I'm not aware that one does so far. If you are moving to C++14, we have the generic lambdas. And this here is a generic lambda, so all the time you're seeing auto as a parameter type. It's a generic lambda. And the good thing here is it enables me to write more generic code because I can formulate this lambda once, write it once, and then I can use it as shown here either with 2.0, which is a double, or just with 2, which is an int. I can invoke it, it will do the right thing. And if you peek behind the scenes, and look at this in C++ Insights, then we can see what that thing does is that my call operator now becomes a template, a method template. In my case, because I only provided one, or the lambda only requires one parameter here, I only have one type template parameter. And we can see below here, because C++ Insights also shows you all the template instantiations, I get one instantiation for an int and one for a double. So once again, I'm really impressed how easy sometimes things can be added to the language and they help us to write once again less code. What can you do with generic lambdas? Now that we are knowing that's a template, we can do things like this. We can use C17's context brief together with decal type to get back the type which was formerly deduced by auto to say, okay, if that type is the same as a double, then I'm not multiplying it just by 2, but I'm multiplying it by 2.0 to reflect that I'm now doing a correct double multiplication. And of course, depending on what's else uh, calling this lambda, my second line, the else case would be wrong because, well, multiplying it just by two might not be sufficient for every type. But you can now be more specific here about your types because essentially you're in a template. Even that's, you've written a lambda, it's a template now. Now this is something which caused a few headaches since we received lambdas in C++11. I call it a dangling reference trap, which partially gives probably away what I'm asking about. I have a function here, func. It has an int x in it, and then I create a lambda. The lambda captures by reference, and what it does is it calculates x times x and returns the result. And then, in the last line of this function, I'm returning this lambda. Question. Is that good? Wrong. As a consultant, that's excellent. Now we can expand debugging hours. Correct answer is no, it's not good, because essentially you're turning a reference to something which is on the stack and it's not longer there when you returned that thing. So you should never return a lambda that captured something by reference. But the more deep question is, what does the standard says? say? Is this undefined behavior? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Okay, there's a large middle part sleeping or watching on YouTube the other live stream, right? Okay, this is my probably favorite quote from the standard. This is what the standard says. If a non-reference entity is implicitly or explicitly captured by reference, invoking the call function call operator of the corresponding lambda expression after the lifetime of the entity has ended is 
likely to result in undefined behavior. I isn't that great? I mean, with undefined behavior, it can work, but it has not to. It can break any time in the future. And now you have likely, which means, well, it, it can, but you don't know. <laughs> Brilliant, right? Brilliant. I believe there may be an architecture out there which can deal with, uh, because different stack handling can deal with this, so that's why it's only likely undefined behavior, but on most platforms it is just simply undefined behavior. But it's a great part in the standard. So, now a new colleague comes in and different requirements. Now we need to allocate this variable x on the heap. So someone was able to squeeze in a new here, plug in a couple of pointers. Also the uh, calculation inside of the Lambda was correct. And beautiful, nice code. Still capturing by reference, don't, uh, still capturing by copy, so I don't return anything I captured by reference. What do you think about this code? Yeah, it's a tiny one, so it can survive a long time. But essentially, it's correct. It's a memory leak because I'm not deleting what I've allocated. It's a simple to solve problem, right? So sort the intern, and well, what's missing is the delete. So plug in the delete. Okay, people told them that he should not capture by reference because that's unsafe. He captures by copy, so that's safe, so I have to delete the pointer because otherwise I'm leaking memory. Brilliant, right? So now no memory leak, but I'm still back in the undefined behavior world because now I'm pointing to something on the heap which is not longer there or does not longer belong to me. We can fix this, of course, with using C++11's smart pointers, shared pointer or unique pointer, for example. Let's talk a little bit more about captures. Here I have a class test which has one int member called A, and inside of the constructor I create a lambda which captures A by copy and adds 2 to A and returns the result. Then I'm the printf guy, so I use printf here to invoke the lambda and print out the result, and just because I can, between the two printfs, I'm pre-incrementing a by one, and then print out the lambda once more. Question to you. What do the two printfs print out in numbers? And let me help you so far because it's early in the morning, two plus two is four, I just checked on my iPhone. Two times four, you're saying. Okay. Then there are a few people who pretend to sleep so they can claim later that they knew it better. Um, it's of course four and five. Why wouldn't it be, right? Why is it four and five? It's four and five because what you're doing here is maybe not what the compiler thinks you like to do. We are capturing A here by copy. But A is not a simple variable, and we are capturing by copy. And what do we write, we omit it usually, before this A? It's this error A. And what happens here is that the compiler captures our this pointer by copy. Because that then contains A. But because it's only a pointer which is, cap which is captured by copy, we see the increment of A inside of the lambda. So we can fix this or can improve it by using C17's star this or dereference this because now I'm capturing the object this, not as a this, not as a pointer, but as an object. Now you're correct and the answer is four and four. This is a trap you can occasionally find yourself in. This is a different way of doing this. 
it's safe now. We uh, I dropped uh, a few parts of this full example. And the question is related to the size. How does this now affect the size of my lambda? And if I go back to C++ insights, and I transform this, then we can see what a lambda captures is in fact what I told you, it captures the object test. Which is partially okay. Um, for me it means that I'm still capturing B, because B is a member of test, so I'm capturing A and B, because I'm capturing the whole object. In uh, pie chart terms, I'm capturing twice as much as I need in bytes, so that sounds bigger. In bytes, it's okay, but it's, it's still more than I like, I required, or I require. And for embedded systems, if they are small enough with their constraints, then that can be an issue. So it, it works now, but it still has some drawbacks. And one way out of this is using C++ 14's init captures, because we there can say that in the capture list, we create a new variable, A1, which is initialized by A, and A1 is then accessible inside of the Lambda. And now I am sure that I only captured the one int I need. You can, by the way, also say in the capture list A equals A. It's a readability thing and I do not claim that A1 is so much better than A equals A, but just to point out, you can have here A equals A, which makes it hard to read, but it may also give your idea to a certain reader that there is no difference between A and A. It's just that you need to do it that way to not capture the entire class. And if I transform this in C++ insights, then we can see what the Lambda now has as member, as its only member, is in fact the int member I requested, which is called A1. So this is the most efficient way you can do this. And imagine in the example before capturing the class, that may not be the worst thing in the world, but if your class has more members than just the int and maybe more complex members, let's say capturing a couple of stud strings there, and they have to be copied, they need to allocate their memory and so on, and you just need that one string, then it creates a lot of resource usage, which is just unreasonable. So this is the best way you can do it. This is another question to the size of the lambda, it's more or less the altered version from before. I have in my constructor of the test class now uh, additional const int variable called size initialized with two. And then I have a lambda that captures once again everything by copy it uses. And this time, except from the fact that it returns a plus two, it creates an int array called x, which is of the size from this outside size variable. Let's make the question easy. Is this size variable captured inside of the lambda or not? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Someone later has to explain to me what the rest thinks. But thank you. Um, it is not captured because it's not ODR used. 
And this is once more where the compiler is really good to us. Only the things that required to be captured are captured. So if I do the transformation here, we can see, yes, I get this array in the call operator's body, but all that is captured as member is my pointer to this here. So once again, compiler is on our side. Don't capture what's not necessary. What's next? Here I have a couple of lambdas from A to F and a std string called foo and all the lambdas do either capture by copy, by named copy or by named reference. Some of them do print out the string foo, others don't. Assuming you have a smart compiler with the highest warning level Question is, how many unused variables warnings will you get from your compiler? Let's say give me a number from 0 to 8. And whoever says 8, please explain where the 8th come from. 2, I have. 1, 7, 6, okay, we are in the countdown mode. Five. So many answers. Wonder what your compiler is doing. Correct answer is three, and I walked you three to this, through to this. So let's look at A. In A, I capture by copy, and I use foo in the printf. What happens if I capture a string, or if I copy a string to be precise? The copy constructor allocates new memory for the destination string and copies over from source to destination. This is, from a compiler's point of view, in this case, a side effect, which means that usually we like to see the effect that we copied a string, so the compiler cannot optimize this copy away because it's observable. So that's why A does not trigger an unused variable warning. B, on the other hand, well, it's an empty lambda capturing everything it uses, while it doesn't use anything by copy, so that gives you an unused variable warning. C essentially is the same as A, just that this time I specifically capture foo by copy. D is interesting. It's interesting because some people say that you should always use named captures to be precise what's being used in the lambda's body and so on later. And in this case, I don't use foo in the lambda's body. But because of the copy construction of the std string I chose here, I still get a copy. From a compiler's point of view, you can think it like the compiler probably thinks, well, you're a fool doing this, but if you really insist that I capture this foo variable for you, well, I do so, sure. It's not at worst as using reinterpret cast anywhere, so I'm happy to capture that. So if you request it, you get it, regardless whether you're using it or not later on. Then following is E and F, which is a capture by reference, so there is no copy involved, so the compiler can tell you about the unused variable. So this is the uh, places where you get the unused variable warnings. It's B, E, and F. And I think that's worth to know because I've seen such lambdas there. They are looking innocent because they are not invoked everywhere. And sometimes the code I've seen is that the lambda was created for debugging purposes and it was only invoked if some if the debug macro was enabled or whatever code pass was triggered. And the impression was that this lambda, that this lambda doesn't do anything, but it's wrong. Every time you pass such a lambda, it does in fact copy. If it's a small string, it doesn't bother you much probably, but if it's a larger string, let's say string contains the Lord of the Ring books, then it may take up some time. This here is C++ 17, and I mentioned with C++ 17 earlier, we 
got now context parameters. And context parameters enable us, for example, to have here a context per int array called r, which is of size 5, and then a context of a bool called all even, which invokes the std all even function or algorithm, which compares all of or checks for all of the elements in that array with the lambda whether the value at a certain index is even or not. And then it returns that thing. So that can all happen at compile time. And if you are now asking yourself why I gave you that gray code here, it's because I'm really cool and I know how to copy from CPP reference. Um, the sad thing is, lambdas became const expert with C17, but unfortunately, not all our algorithms are const expert. There are way more const expert algorithms with C20, but for the 17 case, I had to copy from CPP reference in that case the algorithm and add the const expert keyword in front of it. So in C20, the same code looks like this because I can drop all the copy of the std algorithm, I can use the regular algorithm header and write it like it's shown here. The other benefit you can see if you are a fan or like std array, std array is now also const expert because the uh, members begin and end are defined to be const expert and now I can switch from a raw array to a std array and using that also at compile time. So two additional things that came in with C++20, begin and end, are const expert now and way more algorithms are const expert. I think we've missed only a few. How can we use lambdas? This is an example from C++ Insights. When generating code, A common task is that there is a function defined, there's probably a call to a function, there's an if statement. All the time there are parentheses around things or curly braces to mark a body, to show the parameters or function definition. So initially I had all over the place in the code code like, oh, do I need a curly brace or do I need a parentheses? Is it opening or closing? And so on. So what I then did is I extensively used lambdas and wrote this function template here, wrap in parents or curlies, don't mind the spelling error. And it now enables me to have that code in a single place, which makes it much more maintainable, and it dropped a lot of lines of code in the code base. And what I'm doing here is that I'm just saying whether it's parentheses or curly brace I need. The code then handles the insertion of before and after, and with the lambda I can inject the actual string or code part I need to go in between the braces. That's excellent. The next thing I found in the code base is that I have my own for each arc algorithm. You probably know the std for each algorithm. In that case, it's specifically for each argument because if you're dealing with arguments, it's a simple rule, you know that. There is no comma before the first argument and there is no comma between the, uh, behind the last argument. So. You need all the time to figure out if you're generating the code, whether there's a comma required or not. It's easy for us humans and it's easy to um, write it in code, but it was once again an example which was spread around the code base because I needed it in a lot of places. And what I did here now is partially the same what the uh, std for each does. I have this std each, uh, for each arc function template, which loops over the arguments I passed in and takes care of inserting the comma if required or not, which once again makes the code at the using side much more readable and dropped a lot of lines of code. This is um, 
code which we are able to write now. It's it's not something new in a general sense. Other languages did such a pattern earlier because they all had lambdas. It's I think it's coming from Java or JavaScript, and there it's called immediately invoked function expressions. And what I'm doing here is I like my variables to be const. And in this case, it's not easy to make that std string name const because it's initialized either with something which has operator in its name or just with the function or method name. So two possibilities to initialize this to string. Typical example is don't make it const, pick the more likely case, initialize it with that, and just in the other case do a different initialization. You can also use the tenary operator to do this initialization, but it doesn't, at least to me, look readable. So with this immediately invoked function expressions, you now can have a way to make that std string const, which I prefer, and have a nicely written C++ statement inside. And what I'm doing here is that I create a lambda which returns a std string. This is one of the cases where I needed to use the trailing return type because once I return a std string and the other time it um, was in the beginning at least a char string, and then the lambda is directly invoked, so whatever it returns will go into this std string and initialize that std string such that it can be const. I really like this pattern. Another place where it can be used is something like this. I deal a lot with POSIX API, and here I have a function read data which takes a C++ 20 like span as a buffer and then it opens a file, it returns a file descriptor, and then I check whether this open was successful, so the file descriptor is not minus one, it's greater than. If it's minus one, I return, maybe the file was not there or whatsoever. I return zero because I couldn't re uh, read anything from the file. But if the call was successful, file is open, I next do a read into the buffer, up to the size of the buffer from this file, and after that read I once again check, was that read successful or did it fail? Minus one in the POSIX API implies that something failed, so if that's the case, I return once again zero because, well, couldn't read anything from the file. If not, then the read was successful, the file is truncated, closed, and the size that was read is returned. Who does spot the bug? See in one hand, two hands probably, three hands, four, okay, going up. So what's the bug? Just yell it out. Unclosed file. file. Because I didn't close the file when the read was not successful in line 13. I'm just returning there which is, in fact, something that happened very early in my career. And it can take a long time until you realize it, because the kernel has a lot of file descriptors, 1024 or 4069. So depending on the frequency, it can last for some time. So I'm interested in a way to fix this in a general case and in a more stable and robust case. Let's say I introduce a yet unknown type which is called final action. I create a variable out of this type and I pass a lambda to this final action thing while creating it. And that lambda does the check. It checks whether the file descriptor is equal to minus one. If not, it closes the file because obviously it was successfully opened. That means that I can drop we will peek behind what the final action is. That means that I can drop the close in every other place. I do not need longer to care about my return statements. I can drop the close everywhere and just return, which makes this code really easy to be 
um, changed or altered or increased whatsoever. So, and the implementation of final action is this. It's a class template called final action taking one template parameter t. It stores in M action as a member of type t whatever is passed into it. It tries to format, uh, forward into M action whatever is passed to the constructor. And then, and that's the brilliant part, in the destructor, it invokes the lambda. And with that, every time we are leaving the scope, that lambda is invoked and ensures that my file descriptor is closed. Nice and easy. For the lines of code, they work if you are interested in a bigger solution which is capable of doing more. I suggest the guideline support library. There's at least the Microsoft's implementation which can handle um, other cases as well and copying that thing and so on. But for starters, this is what's needed to clean up the resource here. With C20, we will get what is called Lambda Capture Pack Expansion together with Move or Forward. So, what I'm doing here is I have a variadic function called Invoke Later, which takes an arbitrary number of arguments. And in that function, I'm creating a Lambda which is directly returned, which captures all the arguments which were passed into the function, into the Lambda, to call function with these arguments later. And before C20, I was not able to apply std forward here to all the arguments for the init capture. Okay, I had to copy them before or find other tricks, other ways. And with C20, I now have an efficient way to be in more places, perfect forward, correct. I can now just forward the arguments I received from the invoke later function into the lambda without unnecessary copies. That's nice. Another thing I mentioned that before is that we now have templated lambdas. And templated lambdas solve a problem I'm illustrating here. Yes, with C14 I can write generic lambdas and they make these two max calls working. So what I'm having here is a Lambda called max, it takes two parameters, it tries to figure out which one contains the greater value and then returns this one. S simple. And then I have two calls to this lambda, one with 2,3 and the second one with 2,3.0. And 3.0 is a double, so in my opinion that should not easily compile because now I am, well, giving an int and a double in there, so I'm mixing types. And there is no easy way to prevent this, except if we are thinking back to the context per if and the same decal type stuff. But with C20, we will have templated lambdas. Now I can write the ankle brackets after the closure declaration and say, for example, type name T. And now I can mandate that X and Epsilon are of type T. Not any type, no T. They both have to be of the same type. And because we are now once again talking about templates, the second max call in line number 9 does not compile anymore because there are no implicit conversions when it comes to templates. And if we are looking about this in C++ Insights, Then we can see there is no big difference to the generic lambdas because our call operator is still a method template. The only difference now is that I can say what the type is and that both types are of the same or both arguments are of the same type, which is something I cannot do easily with generic lambdas. So, but behind the scenes, nothing special compared to the generic lambdas. What I can do with that is I can say, okay, my lambda takes a std vector of type t. That's something I couldn't say with the generic lambdas before. And just to highlight this, it's not 
limited to type parameters. You can also apply non-type template parameters as in the second example. I can also say that my Lambda takes a std array of type int and let the compiler that use the size of the std array that is passed in. So I can also use non-type template parameters together with that. One more thing that comes in with C++20 is something that tries to solve or make this code a little bit nicer. I have a std map here and I like to apply a custom comparison operation. And for that, I write the compare function as a lambda, of course, before the std map. Just to then say in the declaration of the std map, decal type of compare to get back the type of the lambda I created before. So that seems first a little bit unnecessary. And secondly, the compare function on line number one leaks into the adjacent scope. And it's probably only required and used here. With C20, we can use captureless or default constructible lambdas in that case inside of a decal type expression, which makes me able to move that lambda I had assigned to compare before directly into the std map. To this day, I'm still undecided whether I like the syntax and I think it's readable, but it makes it more clear that these things belong together. Now that we talked a lot about lambdas, there's a question about overuse in lambdas. And if I remember from Victor's talk yesterday correctly, he mentioned that since C++11, people started to squeeze in lambdas everywhere in the code base. And so did I. I found out when I prepared the talk. This is once again an example from C++ Insights. And if you're looking, looking closely, what I'm doing here is I have a bool, const bool, is list initialization. And to initialize that bool, I have a lambda which captures by reference, and it essentially returns a bool. So um, it's nice, but this is nicer without a lambda, to be fair. So I think I fixed the code in the meantime. But yeah, there is a potential to do that. If you're interested in lambdas, there, there's a lot of work of other people out there. I'm not the only one. Um, there's a really great talk by Björn Faller, who was later this day another talk. It's called High Order Functions for Ordinary Developers. He gave it at least at Meeting C++ and other conferences. And there are blog posts there. There are uh, YouTube videos just about lambdas. So there is uh, a lot of fuss about lambdas. All right. I talked a lot about lambdas, um, and the time more or less is up. So there are just three more words I'd like to say to you, and that's I am fertig. <laughs> Thank you. Ja, fantastisch, sehr schön. Danke schön. Danke. Und jetzt Fragen und Antworten, also known as Q&A. So if anybody's interested. And please use English for the sake of the room. Oh, you can use German. I can translate. <laughs> Floor is yours. Any questions, please join us here downstairs. Actually, I have a question. Uh, is the CVP insight actually somehow uh, getting into the compiler to, uh, to show what the compiler really, uh, how the compiler sees the Lambda? Or are you generating the code based on the standard, what it's supposed to be? OK. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Always question the tools you are using. Um, so what C++ Insights does, it's, it's a Clang-based tool, and it uses the AST that Clang generates for, um, for you when parsing the code. So for the Lambda, it goes that Clang, in fact, generates an AST node with the class and everything just without the name. And um, I have to well, to fiddle a bit around um, for the constructor. So the compiler, at least Clang, doesn't bother to create an AST node for the constructor. So there is a, a little bit made up stuff. But in general, I try to stick as close to the AST as possible. And most things, surprisingly, are there. Um, so I try to not squeeze in my knowledge, because that could be wrong. However, it means that it works only for the, well, it shows what Clang would do, but not other compilers. Yes. Correct. So it shows what 
it chose to code with the eyes of Clang, plus with, in, in some cases, with the eyes of the standard library. And um, per default, C++ Insights on a web page uses um, libstud C++, which is the GCC library, but you can also use it with libc++. So you see implementation differences there. But yes, GCC, in fact, can do things different as long as it's in the range what the standard defines, but yes, yeah. And I have another one. Uh, in our code, uh, when we using when we are using lambdas for standard algorithm, we often tend to get them out of the argument and name them as a variable, a meaning meaningful name, just to make the expression shorter and somewhat more readable. But then there is a problem. There are two schools. Uh, some people use auto for the variable, and then probably if they remember it, move it into the algorithm, mm -hmm. or the other school uses const autoref and then just mm -hmm. passes the argument without moving. Which one is better, or is there any difference, actually? Well, it's probably hard to, t uh, to tell. I would say it's mostly a matter of taste from what you described, and I understand that there is the risk that you're forgetting to move it um, with, with the for first version. Um, I personally a little bit prefer not to have to pick a name because for me uh, it's hard to come up with a proper name just because you like to feed it into the algorithm so but that's my personal thing and it has nothing to do with performance so if you are not missing the, the stood forward or stood move from what I understood I think they are equivalent in, in terms of performance. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Anyone? Okay, shall we do the phrase? Because I guess I'm fertig can mean I'm ready as well as I'm done. Yes. Okay, so now it's the latter. So everybody, I am, I am fertig. Thank you very Thank much, you. Andreas Fertig. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you. Really cool. <laughs> So now the usual, the break, 20-something uh, minutes. As you can see, the room is quite packed. So if you absolutely uh, want to reserve a seat for the next talk, just uh, don't go out, just stay. Uh, otherwise, uh, time for a break, and we'll pick up at 12, please. Nice one. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Welcome back. This is going to be the third talk today, but before another Nokia word, and this time it is an adjective. It's quite a long one, and it has six syllables, and it's a very, very Nokia word that we actually coined with Nokia several uh, years ago, and it's connected with cloud, and the definition is... What do you call something that can be sent to a computing cloud with absolutely no chance of returning? That's it. Uncloudifiable, everyone. <laughs> okay, let me help you. It's uncloudifiable. So, uncloudifiable. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, with that, let me move on to our next speaker, whose name is Sambath Logakrishnan. And Sambath comes from Webstack land with more than a decade of experience. M well, also mistakes and wisdom that comes with experience. He's curious about bleeding edge technologies and raw poetry. And his mission is to make business user experience to the point and easy to use so that there's no manual needed. He loves to talk about uh, yoga, jazz, food, and non-traditional movies. And the latest thing with um, Sambath is that he's become responsible for a new life. And the new life, I'm not sure if Andreas is still in the room, but the new life is a German shepherd. And Sambath promises that he will raise this German shepherd to be a very responsible citizen. But this time, uh, Sambath is going to talk about why you should start to think about compiling your code into web assembly. A warm welcome, please, Sambath Logakrishnan. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep, you can hear me. Uh, my name is Samit Kumar Krishnan, and uh, as Rafael mentioned, I'm coming from Webstack land. Before I get into the talk, I have uh, some questions for you. How many of you, uh, of you guys here are C, are C++ or Rust developers? Raise your hand. Oh, a lot. How many of you are JavaScript or web developers? Uh, quite a few, that's good. How many of you are here module developers? You own your own modules. Okay, that's good. Uh, today we're gonna to talk about WebAssembly, the, the new standard that has been around for the last five years, and right now it's getting a, get a lot of momentum. And I'm gonna give you an... Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm gonna give you an uh, um, uh, informative talk about WebAssembly today. Let's begin. Uh, right now, uh, 2015 and uh, 14, uh, the standard came up. WebAssembly standard came up from Mozilla uh, as a more like an uh, coin to uh, alternate something for a JavaScript. We know all that uh, JavaScript sucks. There is no literal way to put it another way because it's a ty dynamic type language and it comes with chaos. And I'm a JavaScript developer for more than a decade, and I know it for sure. And I always also looking for an opportunity to learn something to adapt to the web, but there is nothing there, only JavaScript. If you want to code something in Java web browser, you need to be asked to be JavaScript. But luckily, this came. The standard came as an idea. Initially, it was more like a speculative. This won't be an another deal because there are a lot of initiative happened and everything gone, eaten up by JavaScript uh, ECMA standards. But uh, this becoming uh, not becoming a, a standard. It becoming an, from idea to an actually an uh, a thing that is more like an, a standard that is being implemented by all the browser major browser right now in the uh, 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 web from uh, f from uh, Chrome to Firefox, Safari promised, IE became Chromium, so almost all the browsers right now supports WebAssembly, and already the MVP standard already there in the browser. Today, we're gonna talk uh, about, uh, in from the uh, point of history, w why the WebAssembly is needed from the point of history. Then uh, we're gonna talk about the problems we faced in the history and how the web is going to solve it. And also we take a look at the, the future, what's hold in the future right now, and how WebAssembly can also solve that problem too. And we're gonna take some look at the, some features that coming 
that's going to come and also already available in the WebAssembly and the current state of the WebAssembly in the, uh, in the companies, uh, how it's been used in right now. Let's begin from the history. Before that, uh, you know that I'm a JavaScript uh, developer and uh, I wrote, generally wrote business logic. I didn't care about system programming language like C or C++. I don't even care about system calls. I always keep myself to business logic. That's all my side. I don't want to go into the system call uh, world because I have no idea what it is. But I have to enter right now to it. Let's go back to the history, 90s. Uh, uh, this is the time I started to uh, see the computer in my life, and uh, I able to understand what it is. First program I wrote this was in BASIC in Microsoft. Some addition program. After the addition, I lost myself. This is my world. And during the time, something came up. Object-oriented programming language came up. Something called Java. You heard about it, right? Java. It became a big deal in 90s. Uh, it becomes with something called virtual uh, machine. Uh, even though the concept was available from 1960, but they made the virtual, uh, virtual machine as a more like a uh, shiny new toy that everybody likes to have it, uh, and came up with this idea of bytecode. Uh, that means so you can build once, you can run anywhere. This is an idea that became more like popular because of its uh, box runtime and also because of its marketing, because Java spent millions and millions of money on marketing the Java. It almost spent about $250 million from uh, last uh, 90, in the, in 19th, from 90s decades. It spent almost $250 million on marketing alone on Java. That's why it became uh, the world popular tool language right now. Otherwise, it's not uh, that much popular. It's because of that marketing was involved. With the Java, some problems came. Java was successful language in object-oriented programming language, especially in the web world. It solved a lot of problems. It opened web development to the pe people for uh, object-oriented programming. So it's very simple to develop the language and deploy everywhere and, and uh, deploy everywhere in server. But the same idea didn't work out in the browser. Uh, build once and run, run, run everywhere. You know that uh, the applet, Java applet, you how many people write Java applets? How was the experience? It's terrible, right? It always comes with a lot of quirks and things. It works in IE, it won't work in Firefox. That time it was uh, uh, called uh, Netscape, its name was. Always there was a uh, uh, difference was there. After that, uh, everybody removed it. Applet requires a lot of magics in the browser. You need install browser. Your operating system has to be some uh, uh, level up. Uh, Microsoft has to be some uh, level up to uh, make it work. It has to have the Java runtime. And security is a big hole. There, there can, you can do a lot of attacks on the applets. That uh, it's more like you're basically opening your system to the entire world and give, take it me kind of approach. So, but in the browser world, you didn't pick it up because of the security issues and also for the development cost, it's very high. But the idea of bytecode or the P code, because the, gen the, the general name of the bytecode is P code, uh, uh, gave a boost that uh, you can able to give that portability. After the bytecode, uh, Android came, and with the portability that uh, you can able to do it. So this portability became more like a uh, necessity for a uh, web stack developer, or for any developer right now. After that, it also freed the application developer from knowing the system architecture to make a uh, uh, call to a file system or a socket or anything. I just need to make a call to Java. I don't know how the Java is going to do it in JVM level. It do the magic. And I'm, well, I, I'm opening a file, I'm sending a, a message in the socket. So, but it gives me that uh, uh, a gap to know, uh, doesn't know to know about the system architecture to uh, program something in application level. At the same time, in 1995, we, uh, uh, there, uh, there are two things happened. Browsers came up, in uh, interactive browsers started to coming up. One is IE, one is, Netflix, uh, one is uh, Netscape. How many people still use Netscape? I have a machine in my home that is 1995 Windows and still have Netscape. I use that for some game purposes. I, because I have some score, I don't want to erase it. So just keep it. That's why I have a machine and still make it running it. I still have it in my home right now. I actually exported from, uh, I imported from India with a huge duty price because this is some hardware bullshit. Uh, uh, let's talk about the JavaScript. 
uh, there was a, a, a duel going between the Microsoft and Netscape, because who want to take over this uh, new market, web? So they both are coming with the two different languages. One is JavaScript from the Netscape, another one is called VBScript from Microsoft. How many people you have heard about the word VBScript? <laughs> That's cool. I also programmed a little bit uh, on the VBScript, and I hated myself. It was more like a Visual Basic on uh, became a script kind of stuff, so I didn't like it. Luckily, Microsoft itself killed it and moved it to JavaScript. JavaScript was a success, and let, take, let, uh, uh, it's a huge success right now. It's one of the highly contributed languages in the world, and in GitHub, it is the number one all-time champion, almost 12 million developer, active developers are there, and every year almost 2 million developers are getting added into JavaScript. It's more like we want to become a developer, right now the entry point is becoming a JavaScript developer. That's the, uh, how it is, looks like in the general world. Let's take a look, let's take a look into the, the history of JavaScript, how JavaScript came into the, uh, the name JavaScript. Uh, general, uh, we, during the time, uh, Microsoft came with VBScript, Netscape wanted something similar, but the Netscape had a partnership with Java during the time, Sun Microsystems. And uh, ja uh, the, the, uh, the, the author of the uh, Netscape, author, uh, uh, Netscape wanted a uh, Lisp-oriented programming language for the, uh, as a scripting language, not as an uh, object-oriented programming. But due to the pressures from the, uh, Microsoft, from the Sun Microsystem, they have to go to object-oriented programming language and also put the word Java inside in front of it for marketing purposes. They thought somehow Java will take over the JavaScript, but it didn't happen, luckily. The first name was Mocha, it's not JavaScript. The, the initial name was Mocha, and it was lisp oriented but it was deprecated uh, before it product got launched. Uh, and this language, JavaScript, initially meant for basic pixel manipulation and just some event handling. It's not meant for complex calculation or anything. It's just meant for single thread, not more than one thread. Enough. Just you take a thread and change something in the UI and give it to the user. That's all JavaScript is meant for. But in 2000, we there was something change happened. Uh, desktop computers will get multi cores. Uh, I have uh, uh, a vivid uh, memory about buying my Intel Core Studio processor first time, and I was trying to uh, overclock it with two cores. How to break the system? During the time, uh, there was no uh, way to use that multi-core in the, in the in the browser world because it's single-threaded. Uh, I cannot able to use it. Luckily, in 2009, HTML5 spec came with a concept called web workers. Still, this concept is not been overall been used. This is the concept of uh, a web worker is nothing but you're spanning multiple threads of uh, JavaScript instances. And you can make it communicate through the post messages, or you can use Shatter web worker to communicate it to use to make use of this course. So uh, right now, most web browsers stopped uh, supporting chat bar buffers because of security reasons. You know, this uh, Spectre bug and Milton bug uh, made that uh, all the browsers to stop using this chat array buffer right now. In Firefox, it's been, been stopped and it means halted. The feature is there, but it's been blocked. Only in right now in Chrome, it's been enabled back. And you know JavaScript comes with a lot of precision problems, especially with numbers, exponents. It always comes with, if you do some kind of a, a math, a complex mathematic, uh, mathematical formula applied on JavaScript, it always comes with wrong results. Because JavaScript is designed in such a way. It is not meant for complex calculation. But people have started using it. Node.js. Generally, Node.js is used to, need to be used for code operations. Pull something from the database, put something in the database, that's all. Do not write business logic on it. But people started writing on business logic on it, and it became a chaos. After that, Node.js has to implement a, 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 a shimming layer of the C, pro, C, lang, C language, so that it can able to do all this complex calculation on that layer and bring that uh, information to here. It's kind of more like in a crazy world. But what to do? But this is the only language for JavaScript, uh, for the browser during that time. Have you heard about this Dart VM? Anybody? It was one of the, uh, in 2013, there was some initiative come from Google that they fed up with JavaScript. They said, enough. Let's do something uh, uh, new. 
so they created a, a new vm within the browser in the chrome it was there available for a few uh, years it's called dart vm it comes with its own language dart it's an a typed language is more like a mix of javascript and java again but it uh, it has uh, uh, stati statically typed and it is much more senior than the javascript but uh, unfortunately this language didn't get any momentum even inside the google so google has to drop this entire vm concept and get it off it right now it's not available but the dart vm becoming an another uh, feature itself right now it's been used in oss that's a different story let's take a look a little bit about the javascript chaos especially when you are opening a web browser and you type some url a javascript comes in it comes in with a content type uh, 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 like a application uh, slash javascript once a content type is like this uh, you telling the browser it's a javascript so begin the parsing first it has to be parsed because javascript is text format so it has to be passed from string to uh, tokenized then validated again retokenized this time it is as tokens then compiled then we execute then we are doing right now in the most browsers like uh, spider monkey and v8 they have something called uh, runtime stats stats this is the first machine learning uh, implementation i would say uh, in 2009 called just in compiler that is more like a how many times in a script function getting executed based on it it is been all, uh, optimized reoptimized and uh, code is getting uh, 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 flexible for that this is my, in my view this is the first machine learning uh, implementation uh, in the wild in the browser been there and uh, it going to optimize it again compile back and you know the whole story and there is gc right now in v8 and in spider monkey if you have if you see a jankness most of the jankness coming from this java from this garbage collection because uh, we are creating too many uh, dom elements and uh, objects and get too much garbage collection is happening so it can it literally can stop the your mobile browser from uh, working it can freeze it that much problem is there you can see that steps there are about five steps need to be happen to make one thing work it's not like download execute no it needs a lot of magic before it has to be happen let's jump into the future right now in the future we will have a lot of devices and we will have a lot of uh, 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 platforms to uh, code for example we right now we have cpus gpu is getting popular in the cloud and fpga are also getting popular in the cloud right now microsoft owning about 100000 uh, uh, cores of fpgas there in the microsoft uh, azure and we need to uh, and fpga coming into smart watches to right now and it's more like it's going everywhere and everything so like we need to uh, have a devices that going to be uh, uh, see if you can be in the, uh, in the ar vr also in a gpu can also be there it also can be I, uh, iot's and clouds and phones and everything is mixed up right now and everything has one thing common they going to run third party code for sure because in the future is all about this your the core also becoming a data there is no install this that install step has to be gone out in the future that's what i'm saying and uh, your code has to be data that means you're going to run all third party code in your devices it can be your cloud your iot's your smart watches your phones you're going to trust a third party cloud i'm not trusting it third party clouds uh, third party codes because uh, 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 it always comes with some uh, hooks or some security issues there are too many categories of devices going to come and kernel architecture also quite soon because i can see that a uh, 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 lot of kernel been uh, uh, been uh, uh, tossed new words have been tossed and the market share going to be hold from uh, big giants from google microsoft to open source organization uh, like linux foundations also going to have uh, their own hardware called uh, you know open risk 5 architecture uh, isa uh, uh, system uh, uh, instruction set architecture uh, something 
it's it's going to be look like this market share in the, especially in the hardware world right now intel is investing hugely on gpus and fpgas they have uh, intel bought a new a company called uh, uh, axion or altron i forgot the name of the company it's in the biggest FPG, fpga ma ma manufacturer and they swallowed it and microsoft going into the fpga and they seeing that fpga becoming a more like big deal google know that they're building their own uh, hard hardware site now tpus NVIDIA coming with an even more faster GPU design, and AMD is on their own track. ARM on their going fast phase, and uh, OpenRISC V is uh, on Linux Foundation getting a lot, a lot of momentum. And we have open power architecture from uh, IBM and Intel. It's more like a mixed match. And also, the last thing, the China and India making their own processors right now. They wanted to have their own ISAs and their own uh, systems. They don't want, want to rely on Intel or AMD anymore. It's a billion dollars. It's more like two billion people going to use separate something different, new architecture that nobody ever have no idea about it right now. So there are a lot of architectures going to be evolved up. So maybe in Europe there will be new architecture. Who knows? Maybe because it's coming from Asia, that's going to can also can be, catch up the same fire in the in uh, in Russia too soon. Maybe. So it's going for system developers. Uh, it's going to be a big uh, hurdle right now because you need to support all these kind of uh, new uh, 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 processors and stuff, and the kernels and everything. And uh, it's going to be chaos. But system architecture has to do it because the system, but not for the application developers because software developers should not worry about this or these things. But it's not so easy uh, for if you want to write a high-level language. For example, I'm going to write in a language called H. And I want to uh, uh, support all this architecture. It's not going to be very easy for my life. So I need to know all these things. I need to focus for China separately. I need to focus for India separately. I need to focus for Intel and everything. And it's going to my life will be in chaos. So in my view, that is in the future going to be a tough job for anybody to maintain this kind of things. And uh, the approach of C cannot be scaled. This is more like write uh, your own uh, uh, libraries and everything for that to make it happen. It's not going to be scaled for everything, for a high level language. Uh, and high level, at the same time, domain language has to be invented. New domain language has to be invented. But it has to not be targeted to the, uh, to the native level. It can be uh, somewhere between uh, 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 below up in the virtual level. It boils down to this, the same thing, virtual machine. But this virtual machine has to has follow, has some to has some kind of criteria. It has to be portable and sandboxed for sure, uh, uh, and also to be high performant has to be there. This need to be there for high perform high level language to run in this virtual machine. And this, yes, new uh, virtual machine. This virtual machine has to be not exclusively, but has to be inclusive. You know, JVM is an exclusive engine because it can, cannot support other languages uh, or Haskell or something. It only supports the uh, special set of uh, uh, instruction sets. But there is a new uh, initiative from uh, Oracle called Gravel, but I'm not sure how it's going to pick it up. But we need something, an inclusive VM that has to support Haskell to uh, Java. This, ha this VM has to, follow, uh, has to fulfill some mandatories, like sandboxed. Sandboxed in sense, it has to be uh, locked out from the sockets and file system completely away. And it has to have an, uh, uh, a memory that bound linear memory that we should not access to the system memory. It has to be bound so that uh, it doesn't know the actual uh, uh, more like fake addresses for its own system. So it won't go and corrupt the other memory that is used by uh, the other uh, programs. So it has to be sandboxed and performant. Uh, uh, this uh, virtual assembly has to be run much faster, really faster, not J like JVM because J JVM bytecode is slow for sure. And it has to be portable, uh, uh, portable bytecode, because uh, most of, as I mentioned, your code has to be data. Uh, so it has to be sent to the network much as, much faster as possible. So it has to be binary and also be to be as thin as possible. And it has to be an easy implementation. For example, an easy implementation can be a stack machine than a virtual and a register based machine, uh, register based machine, because stack based machine is much more easy to implement, and there is no much uh, uh, complex logic involved. Even a CS major student able to write in a stack machine easily. And it has to be interrupt. Uh, uh, it has to interrupt with the host easily. Uh, these are the criteria has to be, this uh, new VM has to be followed. This bytecode has to give these opportunities. 
and uh, this virtual virtu right now the web assembly mep spec, uh, spec specification actually uh, satisfies all those uh, criteria that's good and they proven that in the js uh, engine it's faster really faster it's uh, how much faster is four to three times faster than a javascript after the javascript got optimized that's good and it provides linear memory tables global instances module so that you can uh, do all kind of magic with it and it comes with a, a limited data type it has only four data types i32 i64 f32 and f64 that's all there is no other data type like strings or lists or anything complex data types it's just very limited system but there is a big problem right now here because this mvp spec is meant for an a computational runtime this computational runtime doesn't uh, is boxed completely boxed it doesn't have access to any ios any systems anything is is more like a jail system you put it you are giving a source code and data to it it runs and give data back to you that's all it cannot have he had no idea where it is running or anything it cannot access the file system or ios anything so it's a problem because uh, we want to support uh, uh, give an io uh, system to this web assembly so it will be uh, much more uh, uh, flexible and easy for other high level language to use it in the from smart watches to your laptops to your mobile phone and whatever the ar devices are, or any device that could come but uh, uh, lately after web assembly came mep mep feature came there are people some people started to hack uh, around this web assembly runtime there are some blog blockchain uh, companies like ethereum created their own uh, they forked the web assembly code runtime and they created their own io system uh, to have this uh, uh, web assembly to run it with uh, uh, with ios and uh, file system access but uh, it was not standard it is more like an a chaotic uh, implementation just to see that it's uh, works in the market or not same time uh, web assembly community community uh, see that it is a more like an opportunity than a more like a problem so they think this is the best time to go beyond the w3 console to make it more a uh, big standard than an uh, uh, only for specific to web here comes the new standard called uh, uh, wasi web assembly system interface uh, you know uh, there is uh, right now uh, web assembly core as a community has support from uh, uh, all the browsers Uh, but uh, there is a new community and also there is new supporters also coming in right now Com uh, like fastly cloudflare and uh, dignify and a few other more are getting added right now red hat been added intel been added last week they uh, i'm going to talk about later they going to uh, instead of mimicking this uh, J javascript glue code uh, to talk with this ios or like file system or sockets they want to standardize this uh, uh, uh uh they want hammer out this interface system calls to uh, to in a conceptual os to in a conceptual os then then a real os let's go and talk about a little bit later this about why it is has to be conceptual os then on a real targets before that let's talk about a little bit of problem of the applications generally in uh, uh, an application uh, without an uh, uh, in, without an, uh, an operating system can crash each other based on two things uh, we can uh, uh, while uh, two applications can kill each other based on fighting for resource or uh, another thing is another resource, another application go and uh, listen to another applications data data leakage also be there so there has to be some kind of production has to be there to make this uh, not, don't think this two things not to happen crash and data leak the open the early operating system like uh, oi uh, of linux or windows solved this problem using this ring production in the os uh, it's like a, uh, you have an app like calendar uh, that it's want to access in a, a, a folder in your system it asks the kernel and the kernel checks that this user uh, has this access to that uh, 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 file or not based on it it gives the system it give the access generally the uh, uh, access is based on user user group but last 10 years we have a uh, new changes coming up that uh, we don't have multiple user in one system we have one user but this user runs mostly third party codes right now example docker we are just uh, running in a single user mostly docker has single user and runs a third party usually generally not third party code there uh third party code more like most of the modules where the security becomes very important aspect 
because uh, uh, we are running uh, node modules right now uh, about 10 to 20 percent of node modules are compromised because uh, it's been uh, the developers been outdated and it has been bought by some Russian hacker or Chinese hacker and they put some Bitcoin mining code inside it and uh, they found out that there are few uh, modules which compromised 90 percent of the NPM uh, repository will be compromised because of the dependency chain uh, so uh, there are big problem is there Right now, if you are having a, if in that case, for example, in a, 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 you have an app that has a node module that has a, that module is compromised right now. Uh, it, uh, it's more like it's going to sneak in and buy, get your big Bitcoin wallet. For example, you know how many people are using Spotify app? Spotify. There was a bug last year uh, in the Electron app uh, in the notification that uh, notification module was compromised and this not notification module has a C module inside it, it actually goes and find if there is any Bitcoin wallet is there or not. If there, it steals it. It lived there in the Spotify for four days uh, and uh, many people lost their wallets. So it's actually a real thing that's happening right now in the real world. So it has to be sandboxed. So. Uh, we need to uh, uh, block this kind of uh, risky app from co compromising your uh, your machines. And how uh, 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 your application talks to your uh, kernel, generally using runtime. Before uh, uh, making research to this uh, uh, talk, I was I have an assumption that a C language directly talks to uh, it overrides the kernel. That was my assumption, general assumption. I have no idea. A C comes with a runtime. Even C++ Rust has their own runtimes, and e even uh, uh, WebAssembly has its own runtimes. Even the stack machine is there, and generally the stack machine will implement it on a, a C or C++ uh, uh, implementation. There, so there will be a runtime. The only thing that has no runtime is assembly itself, assembly code itself. I think everything has its own runtime. You know that Node is a fat system. It has a, a JS engine. After that, there is a runtime. So there is a runtime after run, within runtime. It's more like inception. Within it, runtime within it, runtime. So it's a kind of a chaos there. But at the same time, we have to uh, give that uh, uh, flexibility to module developers that should, they should not worry about uh, system, uh, 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 worry about targets to write the code for their modules. Uh, they have, for example, uh, uh, a module developer for a physics engine should not worry about these targets. They have to be more flexible. This all should be uh, more like it has to be in the closed doors, this kind of chaos. That's why it has to be conceptual OS. And it has to be supports security and portability has to be first uh, uh, class requirement. It's not compromisable anymore. It has to be there in this uh, new WASI specification. For instance, uh, we are running on a WASI runtime within your node or in the REST. It has to be sandboxed. For example, an open file in the uh, 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 node has to uh, map to a WASI open uh, conceptual API. And because of uh, conceptual API, after that, the WASI implementation of your target, for example, for Linux 64-bit, uh, has to translate this uh, WASI file open to this uh, uh, file open in the libc uh, file open system. So it has to be tra uh, targeted on the WASI level. And right now, there is one more layer of security has been added to the uh, WASI. The, because uh, the user uh, level uh, security uh, securities is not in, not in, in anymore enough. Uh, we need to give a, a app that uh, uh, yeah, uh, security only what it is required. For example, I have an app that only requires ECT host, nothing nothing else. So I can have uh, able to give that to this WASI uh, WASI uh, runtime that only accesses. EC, EC, ECT host, nothing else. So everything, uh, other uh, uh, system, other uh, directories have been blocked. So any risky app won't be compromised. For even though you're running a risky app, it has uh, a malicious code inside it. For example, I want a uh, password, but it has no access because uh, 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 it has been blocked inside inside the WASI runtime. It, there is no access to it. So your access been uh, uh, um, been blocked. At the same time. 
uh, 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 whatever the uh, uh, the access you are giving, it is given to the all its uh, dependency modules too. So it is more like chained uh, kind of effect. So it is e easier for uh, uh, implementing a, a, some level of security if user wants it. If user gives uh, uh, no security, that means it's running running like a uh, like a system level, system user level. Uh, that's not good. But it, uh, but it at least give an option to, uh, for a user to give a control that uh, you can able to control what file can be accessed by this program. What? Okay. And this is the current status of the WASI spec module right now. Uh, WASI wanted to have this uh, spec has to be modularized so that uh, it can be implemented as fast as possible. Right now, they had some uh, specs being uh, uh, are uh, form, uh, more like formatted or more like uh, came into shape, like socket, file systems, and clock, and random generation. And there are a lot of specs uh, discussion is going on, especially for uh, VPNs, for 3D graphics sensors, and uh, things. You can take a look into the community right now. The community is very open, and they are uh, are. Uh, Giving, uh, accepting a lot of inputs from the users. They are actually, if you can have time, you can take a look into the GitHub page and you can comment about it if you want to have some kind of requirement or you found some kind of problems in it. Let's take a look a little bit about the WebAssembly right now. After the MVP, what happened? Threads are being introduced in the WebAssembly right now. That's a good thing right now. In the MVP, there is no thread. It has to be run in this single thread. So whenever you run a WebAssembly in your uh, main thread, actually your system gets freeze. For instance, you are there was a guy who he implemented a quick game in WebAssembly and ported to the uh, browser. But when it downloads to the browser, entire system froze because it's a uh, single thread environment. It gets frozen. So uh, it was a problem. That then uh, Web WebAssembly team uh, introduced a new spec for threads. This thread is a little bit uh, uh, different from the general thread. It is a host spawn thread. That means host has control over the number of threads has to be uh, being spawned for this WebAssembly. Uh, that means uh, not in the, uh, one WebAssembly member cannot create n number of threads by itself because it's maybe in a security problem or a performance problem because the one module has demanded 100 threads, but system cannot provide it. So it has to be uh, spawned from a uh, host level. Right now in the browser, it has been tied to web workers. So if you want to have threading environment, you need to go to with the web worker uh, aspect. So, But uh, right now, only it has been supported in Chrome because uh, right now uh, Chrome only supports this uh, feature because of Shadarib. Shadarib has been opened in the Chrome. In sued in Firefox because Shadow Rebuff right now is being blocked because of these security issues. Once they got resolved, they will open it so that uh, uh, will, there will be more uh, multi threaded uh, WebAssembly apps will be there in the in quite soon. And uh, there is one more new thing came up uh, with WebAssembly. It's called a single instruction multiple data. Uh, it came uh, uh, right now only in, in Chrome right now. Uh, but in, behind the flag, but the results are very promising. The, the, re, this is very fast, really fast. Uh, general, uh, uh, take a look into the SIMD. You know, uh, SIMD, right? It's uh, it's more like you are going to do a bunch of operations together in one instruction. That's mostly SIMD. For example, you want to do an, um, an uh, a multiplication on an array of numbers. Yeah, generally, if you want to do it in a in, in a loop. Uh, you will going to create an uh, instruction. First, load uh, the number to the uh, register, then multiply and store back into the memory. So we need to do it again and again for every time. But in the simply instruction, we can do it in a more like in the batches. For example, in a 128-bit uh, register, we can able to do it. We can load four uh, numbers together and uh, apply multiplication on it and store back four numbers back. So you are uh, doing it much faster. Uh, like um, this kind of application get faster, especially in the, it will be helpful, really helpful in the browser world. Especially uh, comes to multi, uh, you are dealing with data like multimedia data or uh, machine learning models because most of the machine learning models nothing but metrics, multi-dimensional metrics. So it will really helpful for the browser to pick up the speed and use for, make the use of these uh, cores much effectively. But why it is much more for a big deal right now, SIMD became? It's because SIMD is 
around from 1967 this simd because uh, right now and also cpu supports from uh, uh, desktop from 2000 early 2000 itself but the real game changer happened last uh, march this was in the arm uh, you know in mo your mobile phones right now mobile phones most of the your mobile phones architecture is arm architecture either it's iphone or android based or any symbion based or it's uh, uh, other uh, samsung based os uh, all most of them are, are arm based Right now, ARM provided an, uh, support for 128-bit uh, bit vector registers, and they have a new uh, uh, extension for scalable vector extension. Version 2 is being implemented, and it is being uh, adapted by the uh, LLVM C Clang and also by the GCC 10. So it is more like uh, uh, something that going to be SMD going to be used in the mobile platform very effectively. That means your mobile phone browser can able to uh, have machine learning models quite soon. Uh, that's why the SIMD becoming much more uh, important in the WebAssembly world to make it run much more safer. Let's take a look at a simple program in the uh, 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 in WebAssembly. Uh, so in the, sorry, in the C program, uh, in the, uh, the SIMD instruction. Just an, an array of uh, multiple array. You are doing an, uh, uh, you are doing an uh, uh, multiple operation on, on a, an array. Same instruction to every element in of an array. If you are doing an auto vector, uh, if you uh, if you take a look at the if you compile into the uh, WebAssembly code without a SIMD, it looks like this. It's a loop. First, take an element from the uh, array and uh, from the store and multiply and load it to the register. Multiply and store it back again to the uh, memory. So it has to be do it every time, all the, for every uh, every element. So the number of operation has to be happened is more like uh, number of size of element and multiply by three. Three of instruction has been applied plus one because you need to load the, the this uh, multiplication number ten one time to the register. Sorry, sorry. <coughs> but in the order with the SIMD enabled, the instruction look a little bit different. Right now, in the loop first load. Uh, a four instruction, uh, a four uh, 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 element into the register, then apply multiplication on that and store back it again. So the number of operation got reduced uh, almost uh, by uh, uh, third third of the instruction being been, uh, been reduced. So the instruction the number of instruction reduced for an operation that means the performance the of the performance time get in increased theoretically, and it does. For an, uh, this operation, it's more like uh, we, uh, if you see the 10,000 uh, 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 element, we get uh, more like three times uh, uh, higher, the, higher the performance. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's there for every uh, level. It's not, uh, we get three times more performance on same CPU uh, uh, and single core. So it's good. And uh, do you, you, right now you can see that this uh, right now with the WASI, uh, with WebAssembly, it looks very similar to Docker, LXE based system. Uh, because uh, LXC, uh, Docker is nothing but an LXE manifestation, a Linux container. But uh, if you see that uh, it's Linux, Docker is really performant in, when you run on top of a uh, virtual machine that is based on also on Linux. If it's based on, on, on a Mac OS or, or on a uh, Windows hypervisor, there is a performance degrade is there because there are a lot of bridges that has to be filled up to make it work faster, but it's not that much performant. But uh, the Wasm can able to replace this problem. It can be an alternative to an, uh, Docker itself in most of the cases. That means Docker does not go away, but it can replace most of the Docker's use cases. And uh, you know Solomon, this guy, uh, Solomon Heikis, is the uh, original uh, guy who created the Docker container in uh, 2008, when the company called Docker Cloud. And he was uh, tweeted about in the last March when the web WASI spec came up. He, he told that in 2008, WASI was there. There is no need of Docker itself. Because 90% of the use cases of Docker can be solved with this one. And it is more lightweight than a Docker. Maybe this is the, uh, another solution for a Docker because uh, it can be lightweight, much more lightweight. And a new thing came up right now, last week. The, the new thing is called Bytecode Alliance. Uh, this alliance is formed between uh, Mozilla, Fastly, Intel, and Red Hat to make this WASI spec much more stable. 
from the hardware perspective, from the cloud perspective, to an operating level, operating OS perspective, they need to be standardized very good. So uh, they formed a new uh, uh, alliance to make this happen. And uh, you can take a look into the Mozilla uh, blog post. They explain detailedly why it is needed, why Mozilla can't able to do it by themselves. Because they, are, uh, they told that a lot of gaps need to be, uh, filled, uh, need to be uh, uh, filled before the WASI spec has to be standardized. Let's take a look at a case study right now in the wild. You know the company called Fastly? How many people know a company called Fastly? I use Fastly. It's a serverless uh, platform, cloud platform right now. Uh, it, uh, it supports uh, uh, web assembly runtime as a serverless environment. Uh, right now, they are creating a runtime for every HTTP request comes to the uh, Fastly one. And uh, they are it's much more faster than a V8 engine right now they are in, server, in serverless environment. How many times? In the order of three magnitude is faster, both in time and in memory. Let's take a metrics. Uh, this is the starter time. Right now, the starter time for an, an, a WASI runtime uh, on a Fastly is 52 to microseconds. It's much faster than a, a V8 engine. Right now, V8 engine takes about 5 milliseconds. This is in 52 microseconds. So it is more like uh, these two are two worlds apart. So it's much faster, and it's much get faster when it is going to use uh, in a shared or object. There is no need of object, new object installation is not needed. It's much more faster. It's only 30 microseconds. And doing, uh, if you want to do a memory swap within this uh, runtime, it's in nanoseconds. So it is crazy fast. So the serverless computation, this is a, it can be this is a good runtime for the, to run a high level language. Like, for example, I want to write a Java code, but runs much faster than in JVM. But how cool it is that? Same thing goes for Haskell or Python. But right now, what status right now in WebAssembly? Right now, there are questions like this. <laughs> because right now, uh, currently, 50% of WebAssembly right now in browser are, are malicious, are used for Bitcoin mining or script injections. Right now, if you go to some random website that does a Bitcoin mining, it's based on WebAssembly, actually. And uh, they're doing script injection. Generally, this has been used. But this number going to be gradually going to change once people got take a look into the <coughs> uses of it. Soon, uh, there is a new spec is coming up in uh, web uh, called web WASM interfa interface types. Why it is needed? Because, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, WebAssembly only supports four data types, only numbers. But the high-level languages has strings, string lists, a uh, lot of complex data types. It has to be supported. So they come up with a new uh, uh, layer uh, custom section for WebAssembly called Interface Adapter. It tells, it has a logic, how to convert this complex data type into number back and forth. What it gives us the benefit is that this. Right now, if I want <coughs> in the browser, if I want to run a, a WebAssembly code between uh, Rust and C uh, uh, modules, it has to be goes through the uh, JS back and forth because of trampoline jumps, because there is no uh, uh, connection between, because there, there is no uh, communication uh, data type uh, contract is there not between the Rust and C++. Uh, so C, uh, or C or what C++. But with interface types, we can able to create this kind of um, uh, uh, in interface type. So we can able to import a uh, C module, WASM module, into Rust uh, 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 code and compile into WASM code. So it will be much more uh, friendlier. So right now, I can able to write, in the future, I can able to write a Java code that can talk with and uh, can be imported to Rust code, can be imported into a C++ code. I can compile into WASM code to run it in a runtime. How cool it is that? So that in a, in a, in a, in a a dev team, everybody can choose their own languages, but they can deliver together. The, and it is really good. In my view, it is a really good game changer. And uh, what about high level languages, the garbage collections? Uh, because uh, right now, uh, there is a new spec coming up in WASM for, uh, there is for garbage collection. They are creating Laurel API to use ho uh, host GC to uh, uh, make use of it. For dynamical type, please get a type, because we need a type. Without type, we cannot able to uh, port your uh, example JavaScript 
or Python into uh, uh, Wasm. That's why uh, JavaScript uh, TypeScript, uh, Microsoft coming with a new script called Assembly Script to get rid of this problem, and Python has to come up with something similar to make that happen. And when to use your web, 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 web assembly runtime in your right now? You have necessity that you need to run third party modules in your system. For example, you have a Python runtime, uh, but it has to run a third party codes, and you are not sure about this code security. Then we can run, implement in a stack machine with WebAssembly, and you can run that code inside it. Much more safer C code or C code, much more safer than the, with, without openly running in your system level. Or else you can stay native because native is much more faster than WebAssembly. That's that's for sure. And this is not the end because this spec is uh, getting uh, only get standardized and uh, adoption rate is very high in the browser world. And I can see that uh, cloud computing systems like uh, Cloudflare and Fastly is getting into it. I can see that AWS and also Cl Google Cloud also take a, take, a, take a peek into it. So it's maybe the future. I'm not sure, but uh, it looks like that. And this is hard from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And as ever, if anybody's got a question, please join us here downstairs. Anything regarding the talk, please? Three, two, one. No questions. Well, everything must have been perfectly clear then. Uh, uh, else nothing is not clear. <laughs> <laughs> Either has to be. <laughs> Okay, guys. May I ask everybody then to join me in thanking Sambath Logakrishnan, please. Thank you. So the lunch break is going to be just slightly longer, and we will continue ad, uh, as advertised at 2 p.m. So enjoy your lunch, and do come back for the remaining two talks of the day. Thank you.
So welcome back. You can hear me if you can't see me. There's a very good reason for it. Well, because I'm not on stage, so you need to turn right for a bit. This is for the room and uh, uh, people watching online, you can already see me. The reason I am uh, in this part of the room is this because I'd like to introduce another speaker who has not been advertised in our schedule uh, this year, and his name is David Petlinski, and he's an IT student who wants to be a developer. He he's already studying at uh, a university here in Wrocław, and David is uh, the beneficiary of our collection this year, so if you have pressed the button on our website and donated, this goes to the honorable cause of uh, David. Uh, basically, what this means is that the collection we're doing this year will uh, help David buy a special car so that he can move around uh, the way he needs to and this will help him uh, achieve his goal, which means to become a well-educated uh, developer and then basically enter the business of IT. Uh, so he wants to say uh, a few words to everybody in the room and to our audiences watching online. Hello everyone, I'm David. I'm here because I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to my support. The money that has been collected will be used to buy my own specially adapted car that will allow me to transport more conveniently. Uh, Thank you very, very much for your help, uh, company of Nokia, for organizing the Kodak conference. Okay, thank you for all, thank you for attention. So this was only stage one supporting David and stage two is going to the website, pressing the button and making the donations and thank you very much for doing that. And with this, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who will be speaking now from stage. And his name is Adrian Perret. He has worked in the telecoms industry for 20 years in various positions, uh, covering both R&D and technical support, but also operations, hosting, data centers, and connectivity. And this experience allowed him to have a holistic view across multiple domains and their future impact across a wide range of industries. Currently working as Chief Architect Cloud in Nokia's mobile networks, he is focused on Edge Cloud, well, who isn't, and Cloud RAN and Telco Cloud Reference Architecture. Privately, Adrian likes scuba diving, or to be more precise, cave diving, and apparently, as of this year, he also likes code diving. So, let's give him a warm welcome, Adrian Perret. Hello. Hello, everybody. Okay, so, clear. 
Uh, oh, that's a big, big, big screen. Adrian Perret is my name, and as you hear, uh, I will say a few words about me. And guess what? Well, that's me in the red suit. Well, it's not. You don't see. I don't think you see it red, but the one in the left. That's me. That's a mine in Finland. Uh, it's a uh, it's a big mine with um, uh, kilometers of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, places where you can go. And in the smallest picture in the left, you can see actually to it's me and the same pictures. Actually, I'm scootering through those mines in one of those tiny holes which you see there. And this is what I'm doing when I'm actually not uh, working for Nokia. <laughs> so that's my free time. And most of the time, uh, I manage to get out and then continue working for Nokia. But uh, I like it a lot. Uh, of course, uh, I, I, don't do, I do it when I can, but of course, I don't do it enough. I would like to cave dive more than, than I can, actually I can do. So uh, when I'm not doing that, actually, I'm working for Nokia. And uh, I started as a, in Nokia 20 years ago as a, a support engineer. So I'm an engineer. Now I'm a little bit undercover here with this kind of clothes. But uh, I'm an engineer. And I started when the time, and I think you are most of you very young. So if you might remember the VML time, when internet was first time made available on the mobile devices, I think it was about 2000. And VML is now obsoleted. Just don't try to start learning it. It's useless. Uh, it was the time when the devices couldn't really process much, and HTML was too heavy for it, so it needed to be something more simpler and more more lightweight. So that then the VML came in picture. If you remember, the Nokia 7110, I think, was the first VAP phone at that time. So yeah, it's a long history. Uh, then I moved to Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, from Finland, where it's cold, where you would move to Saudi Arabia, 60 degrees plus. Uh, I was uh, leading a team there, looking after Middle East and Africa on, uh, on value-added services. In telecommunication, that means uh, uh, MMS, like mobile uh, messaging, uh, like VAP, VAP, internet, and so on. Uh, then I moved to uh, hosting. And hosting, it's basically, in Nokia, was a division which was giving very ahead of time data center and services basically uh, as a service. It was very long time ago, 2008, so you can imagine when. Uh, moved to many services, uh, which in, in what means in Nokia there is a division which actually provide, operate other uh, telecommunication uh, providers network. So we, we've been the one operating it in, in, in behalf of the, of the actual operator. And in one point of time, actually, it's not well known, but Nokia was the uh, second biggest operator in the world based on number of uh, subscribers which we've been managing. Um, then I moved as a, a remote access solution chief architect, where what I looked at is connectivity. So connectivity across the world for our global delivery service, uh, centers. And then finally, I ended up in a current position where I look uh, around uh, uh, telco IT cloud, basically. And uh, why I'm listing all of this, uh, first of all, you can see that um, I don't believe that you can learn something very fast and then have something very meaningful to say. So if you, you could see, I spend some time, all the time, in one position except one of them where I've been only eight months or something in the, in the remote access solution. And the reason is that I believe that you need some time to be able to learn, and also you need to see everything from different points of view, not only one way. What, what I meant with this is that, for example, you have a car, which now we are saying, OK, the car with the combustion en engines, uh, they are polluting. So now, depending who you ask, you will get a different solution for it, because everybody has his own point of view. You are asking a, a teacher, they will say, ah, it's all about education. It's all about uh, teaching people and teaching the young generation that what needs to be done. You go and ask an engineer, he will say, ah, OK, we remove the combustion engine. We put in it some batteries or uh, hydrogen or something, electrical motors. That's how we solve the problem. You ask a politician, he will say, well, let's make some laws, regulation. Let's." So basically, you need to see, to look at any object or anything, you need to see, to look at it from different point of view, because it's not always 
the solution which you think is right is not always obvious. So that's why I like to move around and try to be as, uh, to know as little as possible for each domain where I move, so that at least, at least I have something to learn about. Now let's uh, <coughs> talk about, I think, um, about what I'm coming here actually to talk. It's about the edge cloud. Uh, this is a very busy slide, which I have so, so big numbers that I cannot even cope and process with my head. But what, I'm, what it's trying to say is that if you look at the industries, the, the digital industries, actually the annual productivity growth, it's bigger than actually the physical industries. And why, why did that happen? Because the digital industries were very easy to, to, to go in a digitized world. So they could very easy, you have a music, right? You have a DVDs. It was very easy to di digitize them, have them MP3s, and then make them available online. You have books, okay, there was a physical book, you digitize it, you, then you can sell it, very easy. Well, you have a drilling machine. It's not that easy to digitize it, and even if you digitize it, you cannot make a digiti digitized hole. So you really need to have a physical drilling machine which make actually a physical hole. So those industries could not benefit from this digitization. And that's the whole, the whole reason that the physical industry is the annual productivity growth, it's smaller. What can be done about it? I think you hear about this Industry 4.0 revolution. So what does actually mean? So in the first phase of the, uh, till today, basically what we did, we replaced the physical using digital. I was giving the examples of, of uh, books, of uh, music. Uh, these, are, these were very easy to, to replace, right? Now, what is actually Industry 4.0 bringing? Actually, it's bringing the capability to control the physical using digital. And that's the actual revolution where we are talking about. That's why we talk about Industry 4.0, which have a very big impact. But what is different? Uh, I think every, every one of you have some kind of IoT devices, some kind of uh, automation at home, and, uh, or in any other way of, of, of doing it, using it. Uh, but the IoT, if you look at them, uh, they are pretty simple. And their demands are also relatively very, very, they are not demanding. So basically, in the part where you see in, uh, what is that color? I don't know what color you see there. Light, light uh, blue, OK? In the light blue, it's the current IoT devices that we have. So if you have a air conditioning, you have a temperature uh, device which measure your temperature and then it will based on some rules you decide to turn on or off heating or or uh, air conditioning the you won't be butter if the air conditioning starts after five minutes or two minutes it's kind of fine but then when you go to the industries if your drilling machine starts five minutes later or stops five minutes later that's not going to be good it might be a too bigger hole so what means is that in the past, the uh, latency demands and bandwidth demands were limited, not so strict. Now, in the Industry 4.0, there are two parts where demands is growing. We have a latency part where you have devices that you need to control, like robots. You can see in the bottom side. And then there is bandwidth, which uh, it's required as well. And you have a 360 videos. And then, of course, when you need bandwidth and latency, then you end up in the upper right corner like uh, virtual reality, VRAN means virtualized ra radio access network, and plus uh, vehicles, vehicles and so on. So that's the biggest change that all the gray part in, in this representation actually shows the, the difference. And that, need to, to, that kind of capabilities are needed to be able to actually enable and make that happen. Uh, here is for the reference. Uh, basically, it's service latency requirements in milliseconds. The green ones, which you see there, they are human response times. Just for the reference, there is a sprint start, 120 milliseconds. Well, I guess a good sprinter starts, not me. I might not react at all, okay? Uh, and then there is vestibular, vestibulo-ocular reflex. I'm not a doctor, no clue. I, I'm very, and I'm not an English speaker, you can guess, so I, hard to read. 
seven milliseconds. What is vestibulo ocular reflex? Basically, if I'm watching the gentleman in the front row and I'm moving, and I'm still keeping the focus on them, that means it takes seven milliseconds for the brain to react and move my eyes opposite head direction. And that means if that would not happen, actually I would not see anymore the person which I'm looking, it will all become blur. This is just for, for your reference. Now, the light, uh, the dark uh, blue, it's maximum delay inside an application, okay, which is allowed for processing. You can see various examples, and then you have the maximum tolerance in the networking delay, which is the light, uh, light, light uh, uh, blue. And you can see that starts to be very tricky, especially if, it's, if it goes to things like uh, electric heat control, uh, Cloudify radio access network. Uh, you will see values like, uh, for example, for the Cloudify run, we call it vir version 2.0, VRAN 2.0. I will not go into details from, from telecom side, but you need a 0 0.5 milliseconds maximum delay in transport. And then that's a little bit tricky because there are some laws, and there are laws of physics. And not much to be done about it unless some, somebody figure out how to accelerate the speed of light. Before that, we are stuck with it. So what means is that roughly one millisecond, uh, if you want to have a round trip type of one millisecond, you cannot go further than 100 uh, kilometers, because that's the speed of light propagation in optical fiber. And now if you want to have zero point, if you want to achieve a one millisecond uh, latency, and where only the, the transport is already eating 0 0.5, then you have something left, which of course there is processing right in the source, processing in the destination, you might have some hops. So suddenly your distance is actually reduced to something like 30 kilometers in a cable length. So that's maximum what you can do if you want to achieve those latencies. And because of laws of physics and not much to be done about it, then something we need to do to like a workaround. And that means we need to move uh, the computing power, the computing capabilities closer to the actual source of data. And that means the current central, this is a very rough picture, so it's not really that black and white, but it's just representing the, the actual uh, problem and solution for it. And some types of services cannot be provided unless the, the computing is moved and we call them edge data centers. So centralizing things is not anymore possible if you want to achieve those, uh, those capabilities. OK. Of course, the edge cloud is basically pushing the limits to reach the next level. And actually, it's not only about latency. Latency, latency it's one of the obvious uh, problem. But there are other, uh, because latency actually you can see evolution of latency during a timeline. So it goes very low. And then there is a throughput, which actually goes up. And what that means, the centralized data center actually were built as an efficient capacity. And they were driven by the laws of economics. When you centralize, you can man easier operate. You can uh, save cost by uh, centralizing and by, by operating uh, in a one place all your, all your uh, Data center or your data center assets, but the edge data centers actually they are for low latency, efficient transport, and they are driven by the laws of eco, uh, laws of physics. So we have a saying that you should centralize all that you can, and you should uh, put on the edge only what is a must, because having anything on the edge is pretty costly uh, compared with a with a centralized one. Now, what is this all edge computing? Why it's so important? Uh, there are a big amount of, let's say, we call them kind of use cases that are basically driving this edge computing. One of it, of course, I'm coming from a telecom company, and of course, I will start mentioning the remote access network, the radio access network, uh, cloudification, and evolution to 5G, which is one reason of it. Then we have fixed access network transformation. The fixed access network as well, they are uh, driving towards um, transformation towards the edge uh, cloud. 
Then there is latency, bandwidth, and security. They are very critical use cases in the IoT and Mac, which is multi-access edge computing. Uh, there are virtu virtualized and distributed IP edge. Uh, don't, well, you can Google later on all those acronyms. You know, we are, I'm coming from Telco, and Telco, it's a, Telco, it's a funny world <laughs> in the sense that it's always managed to invent all kinds of new acronyms and new terminology for everything. So, for example, we are not saying application. When we put some application in the cloud, we are saying a VNF, which is a virtualized network function. Uh, for me, it's an application. It's just, it's a fancy name to say the same thing and sounds more, I don't know, more cool. But it's nothing else. A VNF, when you hear VNF, which is a virtual network function, is nothing else than yet another application. So nothing new there. Um, by the way, I don't even remember all of these acronyms and what they mean. I mean, after a time of using them only as acronyms, you just really forget what is actually the original meaning on it. Then there is public, private cloud, and open ecosystem. And these are also driving all this edge. Now. <laughs> When we ask somebody, OK, we talk about edge, 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 wh what we mean with edge? Uh, for example, if you ask a car manufacturer and you say, what is your edge? Their answer will be, well, it's my infotainment inside the car. If you ask us as a telecom company, what is the edge, your edge that you are talking? Well, it's the last hop before the remote radio head, which remote radio head, for those which are not from telco, it's actually the antenna which you see on the poles or on the buildings which are your phone is connecting to it. So it depends who you ask, you will get a different answer. But why, what I'm trying to show here is when we say edge, when I'm saying edge, this is what I mean with that. So edge data centers, we are splitting them in two categories. You can see in the bottom side the description. One is a far edge and the other one is an aggregated edge. And the split, it's, it's basically done based on the way how the 5G cloudified radio access network is built. There is a component called VDU, which is vit Virtualized Distributed Unit. And there is another component which sits on the far edge, and usually. And then there is a VCU, which is a, vi a Virtualized Central Unit. And that sits usually on the aggregated edge. But what is important out of this is that the far edge sites, actually, here it's a very conservative number. We are talking about hundreds to thousands. Depends of the country, de of course, because you, uh, I was explaining before about the latency. So it's very depending on that. But in some countries, like uh, North American countries, as an example, you can reach tens of thousands, like 10,000 sites, 10,000 individual data centers to be able to fulfill those needs. In other countries, like uh, China, you can reach even 100,000 to be able to cover what is needed. And that's a very big number of a distributed equipment. Uh, of course, the central data center, uh, we split them in regional and central. It's a blurred line, because as a usually a telco operator or any operator, they don't really have one central data center. They usually have two or three for geo-redundancy uh, reasons, which they all together, they consider them uh, central. So it's a very, again, a blurred line. Is it regional, is it central, and so on. But what is important, it's about the far edge and aggregated edge, which is in the number of thousands. Uh, before going to uh, go in more detail on it, um, just to be clear, there is all, the, all this kind of uh, idea that uh, uh, any application must be able to run on any infrastructure. And yes, that's a great sentence, but it's not exactly like in the movie. So there are some uh, differences. So look, let's look at a timeline here. And let's think that in the upper side, we talk about application. In the lower side, we talk about infrastructure. And guess what? Here are the applications. 1920s, that's how a car looked. And of course, that's how a road looked, right? All fine. That car was running perfectly on that road. Now I have uh, improved cars. I guess you guess what car is that. It's a Lada. Or actually, it's a Fiat, if I, if I remember well the origins of it. Uh, then, of course, the infrastructure, right, which are the roads, they improved as well. And then goes on and on. Application improved, better application, better roads. And now the future. 
We don't know what car we'll get. We don't know what infrastructure we'll get. Now, if we are expecting that the car from the upper right side, so the application from the upper right side, we run at the full power, full performance on the infrastructure, which is a, in a dirt road on the left side, that's going to be tricky. So you cannot have a Formula One car running on a dirt road and then obtain full uh, capabilities on it, full performance on it. And that means you cannot run running cloud native telco application on a traditional cloud infra. It's like driving a modern fast car on a dirt road. So what means is that in the same time when application evolves, the infrastructure needs to evolve. And when I'm saying infrastructure, again, because uh, I've been in looking to other uh, speeches here, and uh, I realized that also infrastructure, it's a very relative term. So when I say infrastructure, I mean hardware and the cloud infrastructure which sits on top to provide you services where you can put your application. That's what I'm saying when I'm saying infrastructure. Now, what are the challenges with the edge data centers? So first of all, they are remote sites, which have limited space and power. Um, I give examples. So limited space, you, you are not anymore in a real data centers where you have a very defined space and you can expand, well, theoretically uh, in a uh, easy when you want to, to, to scale in or you want to put something in. In an edge data center, you might have a very limited space, including the dimension of it. Like, uh, in, in for example, in the telco cases, most of them are only 600 millimeter in depth. And it, it's, it has, a, for example, a maximum power uh, allowed to be 2.4 kilowatts. So when you have maximum 2.4 kilowatts and you have a constraints on the size, then, OK, that's a one problem already. Uh, data center hardware, it's not actually built to be uh, used in, in those use, uh, edge use cases. The cloud, actually, the cloud infrastructure itself, it's not built usually to uh, run on a very small environment. It's not easy to make to deploy a cloud in one server or, or deploy a cloud on a laptop like I have here. Uh, then the management of it is not exactly easy to manage thousands of small clouds. You need to do something about it because definitely you cannot go and uh, if you need to change a password and you have a uh, hundred edge sites, hundred clouds, and it takes you one minute to change a password, it will take you hundred minutes to change a password in hundred sites. So that's not exactly the best job that you would like to have. Uh, of course, proprietary solutions, usually. Um, now, <sighs> I will actually go in more details in actually requirements. So I, I was explaining what are actually the, the problem generated by this. And now, that have some requirements. And uh, I will, of course, read all of them and talk about them. No, I'm just kidding. There is a big list, and you can read later on. But I will actually point out the most important ones. Uh, of course, openness. It's very important to have, especially in an edge site, you must be able to deploy open hardware because that allows you to uh, modularity that you can accommodate inside the same chassis, in same, inside the same equipment, different components. So and you don't need to change everything because now you need some additional equipment there. Uh, it needs to be, of course, uh, energy efficient. But then there is one very important, which you might be noticing or not. There is one sentence called vanity-free design. And that was for me first time when I seen it. I'm like, whoa, what is that? Of course, not English speaker. I have no clue what that means. And actually, it's quite cool, but it's very nicely formulated as a vanity-free design. means that there should be no extra piece built there that have no purpose. Means don't make your hardware to look good by putting labels and additional plastic, which have absolutely no meaning except to look nice. That's what vanity-free design means. Uh, of course, uh, I mentioned the 2.4 kilowatts. And of course, telecommunication, if you want to use this as data center for telecommunication purposes, there are some other uh, standards which you need to comply with, and one is these NEBs. So they need to be built in such a way they are resistant to, for example, earthquake and so on. Uh, now, in, as an example here, 
that is that is a of course I I couldn't come with other example that from from our uh, from Nokia so that picture which you see it's called iframe open edge and that actually allows you to deploy five servers uh, in one chassis in a very tight um, uh, setup which is only 600 millimeter depth so actually you can replace old uh, telco equipment and then just replace it with uh, with this one and you can have your edge cloud by reutilizing your facilities which you have before um, now let's talk about the cloud infrastructure because okay you have the hardware great but if my hardware uh, it's not it cannot be deployed in a, my, my uh, in cloud infrastructure cannot be deployed on a small footprint or it's not providing a certain capabilities then uh, that's not uh, not gonna be exactly useful so there are a set of requirements which comes to the cloud infrastructure to be able to actually deploy such a thing on the edge of course there is again a very long list of things which need to be done but I will go to some very important one so it need to be able to do fast recovery what we mean with fast recovery means that it need to be able to detect a failure in a components of the infrastructure and do an action to fix it in a very short period of time actually it must be below uh, one millisecond and let's give an example if you take um, available solutions and they are using, for example, Corosync and uh, uh, Pacemaker. And that is taking about eight, uh, eight uh, 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 milliseconds to actually detect a failure. Now, if your budget, before you can declare a call dropped, it's one millisecond, but your infrastructure detects a failure and take an action in eight. So, you know, there is a problem. So you need to do something about So the old way, it doesn't really work and that's why it's very important to actually detect the failure in in the equipment including disks networking uh, uh, memory or any component there uh, you need to detect it basically in less than one millisecond the best would be about uh, 0.5 milliseconds so that you have 0.5 millisecond time to actually do some actions like migrating some workloads and do something that actually the call it's not dropped uh, when you have a uh, when you have a distributed uh, site, so you have hundreds or thousands of sites, you don't want to visit them. So what it means is that the whole infrastructure must be able to be deployed, must be able to be maintained. So lifecycle management of it must be able to be done via well-defined APIs. You don't want to climb the pole and go. 20, 30 meters uh, from the ground just that you need to upgrade your KVM. That's not going to be really cost effective. Uh, then, about lifecycle management. So, because the resources are so limited, you have a very small uh, cloud, even that it's, we still call it a data center, but you know, it's like few servers. You can have five servers like an example you need to be able to do all this operation all the lifecycle management must be possible to be done without disrupting the running uh, workloads so that's extremely important because you don't want your call to be dropped you don't want your your data to not work just because now I'm doing maintenance uh, you need to be able to do seamless upgrades seamless downgrades uh, Seamless scale in, scale out. That should not be uh, uh, seen by the applications that run on top. Very important. It's very. Uh, it's needed to be, to be. We we talk about cloud native and we talk about containers, but in reality, there are still many applications which they are not yet, let's say, truly cloud native. And some of them they still use uh, virtualized environment, virtual machines to actually run. So on the edge cloud, because it's a such a small footprint, you must be able to deploy both kind of workloads. You must be able to deploy uh, VM-based or also container-based, and I'm talking bare metal, because deploying a container inside a virtual machine, that's not really efficient. So they must support, we call it hybrid uh, 
uh, integration. So they must have KVM and Docker, and then of course they sh they should be able to they should have OpenStack and uh, Kubernetes as an example, all under the same management. So you see as a one uh, unified infrastructure. Uh, of course, <laughs> we, there was a lot of discussion on security. So yes, they need to be secure, and I'm just telling some, putting some question on it because uh, <laughs> you need to, because now all the sites are remotely. So when you do deployment, so how do you know that the hardware that you deploy there, it's your hardware? How do you know that actually the firmware which is inside those equipment, is it actually your firmware? So how do you know that when you deploy an application on a certain edge, how do you ensure that is that edge actually in the location which I'm actually expecting to be? How do I know that my application actually wasn't tempered in transit? So there are a lot of things which need to be taken care of when you, when you distribute your workloads, in, especially in locations which are not exactly security proof, because they can be a cabinet in some uh, shop or in a factory, or they, c they are not in a very tight uh, with the high security data centers, like the central data centers. I mean, if you try to go to a Google data centers, it's not exactly easy to jump the fence and run around. But if the whole edge is in a closet uh, behind the uh, stairs, then not much security there. And then we go to the management, management and automation. So again, imagine that what is happening today. You have a hardware and you have a software. Now, you want to upgrade the KVM as an example. And what is happening, the infrastructure guys come and said, okay, let's upgrade the KVM and then the procedure starts and then the, the whole system comes back telling, well, the firmware which sits on this hardware actually is not the right one, so we don't upgrade. And what is happening, the team goes to the hardware team, talk with them, hey, go and upgrade the firmware, and then when you are done, let me know. And this, this is absolutely unacceptable, again, when you have such a distribution of sites. When you have hundreds or thousands of sites, that is unacceptable, and it is extremely slow. So what means is that it must be a way that when you trigger an upgrade of the KVM, you must be able to, OK, check firmware is wrong, OK, then you should be able to do a uh, uh, query to the hardware management uh, solution that will actually uh, put that particular server in a maintenance mode, migrate all the workloads to a different uh, running server, do the uh, upgrade of the e software. Once it's done, inform the, the cloud infrastructure that, okay, the, in this case, the unified cloud infrastructure management that, okay, now it's done, please continue your KVM upgrade and so on. And that's the way how all of this should be done and can be done in a very automatized way. Now some use cases. So OK, I've been talking a lot of what are the, 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 the problems in it, what are the requirements, but now what is all this use for? Well, what is this edge cloud, and why do we really actually, in practice, we need it? So there are a few examples which I will cover here. Uh, this is called enhanced maintenance. What does it mean? Basically, you can have all kinds of devices that you can use, like uh, smart goggles or even a tablet or anything that actually can show you uh, what you would actually supposed to do without the need that you go to some manual and you read about them and then you, you, you do the action. So basically, it is showing you in with augmented reality exactly what is next step that you should do to, to do a, a certain maintenance procedure for a certain equipment, identifying it immediately. So all this data from sensors and all this uh, content, this is actually preloaded in an edge cloud because the reaction time, especially on the augmented reality case, need to be very fast. You cannot, if you take all the data and you put it to some centralized data center, meanwhile, the, the latency will be too, too low, and then it's kind of unusable. Video analytics for smart manufacturing. Um, we have actually, um, uh, you can search the YouTube. There is a, uh, in our factory in Oulu, in Finland, we use already 5G in cooperation with the local uh, operators. 
and we use it for quality control on the on the in the factory. So basically, there is an edge cloud which is and the 5G network which is automatically analyzing the video feed from the uh, people which actually does the the building things there, and it is following up if they are doing the correct steps in the correct order and triggering immediately if something it's not right. Um, that's one way to use it, and it's again it's required to be in uh, actually in the real time. And I think the left the picture yes the picture in the left uh, actually it's from our factory where is a technician you can see it's moving um, a sc a screwdriver and it need to be done in a certain pattern in a certain order tightening of those screws and that's the with the video camera on top it's actually following the pattern if the technician does does the action in the correct order and then to to validate on the on the quality of the execution Edge video orchestration. So basically, you go to a stadium, and of course, you can see live what is happening there. But there are many other cameras, many other angles where you can actually all this event it's um, presented. So what you can do, because now the content is required to be processed, captured, processed, and distributed, broadcasted locally only to those which are on the stadium. Again, you have an edge cloud there in the stadium, which is taking all this data. It is processing all the video information and then making it available to the people. They can see rewind. They can see uh, from different angles the same game, even that they are sitting physically only in one position. And that is also it's in use. You can see here in the, uh, I think the left and the middle, it was used in. Uh, some operator in the Middle East, and then the right side was with Formula One, actually, uh, event, where it was used uh, exactly for this uh, purpose. Video, video analytics for public safety. So again, this is another part where there is a lot of uh, usage on this one, because you have a huge amount of data. So think about it. If somebody, there is a security um, guard which sits in front of screens okay and then sees a person like is that that there in the picture there is a person sitting near near a fence because you move between different screens why you what you can say okay there is a person near the fence what did does he did he smoke a cigarette or what did he did there you you really it's very hard to to see the actual what was actually the 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 cause of that particular person being there so but with, if you have all this content locally in an edge cloud, you can do some uh, analytics on it to actually figure out the pattern of that particular person movement, and then trigger an alert, which in this example, that particular guy actually was jumping the fence. So then you know that, OK, this is not there by mistake. He actually jumped that fence. And you can trigger some events based on that. Of course, uh, recognition of uh, face recognition, people counting, and all the other video analytics uh, use cases are as equally valid. And then we talk about connected cars. So uh, this is the part where latency is extremely important, because uh, if you want to have uh, features like uh, platooning, I don't know if you are uh, aware of this. Platooning means that you have a selection of multiple cars, which they start to uh, talk to each other and drive side by side very, very close by because they are all controlling each other. So if the car in the front of the platoon breaks, it is immediately all the rest will break. So without the need to keep that normal distance, which we are keeping now, because you know there is a reaction time till you figure out the guy in front is breaking now, I should break as well. So in these cases, the latency is very important, because you can imagine that, well, if the information from the first car is sent with a, a little bit later to the next car or the, the last car, then things will not go exactly as planned. So these are only very little set of use cases, which are um, drivers for these edge cloud deployments. Uh, I was presenting a lot of um, requirements on it, uh, a lot of challenges about it. Uh, but what is important is that it's, it's unavoidable. 
So we like it or not, the Edge Cloud, is it here, will be here. Uh, you can see in the left side, there are many public available um, um, papers where it's describing various organizations, how they plan to deploy uh, the edge clouds. For example, in the upper left corner, there is ch uh, uh, China Mobile, which is uh, showing that they will deploy about 100,000 edge clouds. Uh, there are gardeners, which are analysts, explaining how this is done. You have their AT&T and other uh, operators, which are clearly uh, planning this future. And then on the right side, there are uh, open initiatives, where actually Nokia is also part of, uh, of most of them where also software is developed to be able to, not only software, but also the hardware, it's developed in such a way that allows this edge cloud deployments. For example, the hardware which I just, um, I just showed to you from, from Nokia, actually, it is built by Nokia, but Nokia uh, upstream, upstream, uh, what is it called, upstream? Upstream, yes. Upstream to OCP, open compute projects, all the design, so now anybody, and it was accepted there, so anybody can build now equipment based on that design. So we don't want to keep it in-house. So we, we consider that upstreaming it and making it open source, it's actually a key to, to success here. Uh, some takeaways out of this. Um, so HDCs, they are clearly needed to provide low latency, high throughput, and privacy. There is no other way around. If you need any of these, only one of these characteristics, or all of them, it's kind of unavoidable. So you would need to have, in one way or another, an edge cloud. Of course, can be small one, like I explained, with only a few servers, but you can have also a big edge cloud. Like you take a manufacturing a factory, it might have like few racks of equipment, which is still classified as an edge cloud, because it just sits in their uh, premises, for whatever reason, privacy, one reason, latency, of course, and then throughput. Uh, converge access, what that means is that having these edge clouds allow you to have, to have a converged access means wireless and fixed. They will both converge in the edge from where basically you can have all kinds of services, uh, all service, everybody will have possibility to get all services from one point, which currently is not exactly possible. And what is the last, and the, but the very important part, without automation, I'm actually calling it extreme automation, this is not going to happen. Because it's not feasible to do anything manually, so all must be fully automatized, especially when all of these are distributed. So there is no other way to achieve this only by automation. And uh, Basically, from, from everybody else, you need to understand, not understand, to, to look at it that this will happen. And of course, it's up to everybody and all of you here to figure out what wonderful services or something can come and can be built based on this with, with uh, the use of these capabilities. So this will come and then, of course, nobody can, I mean, at least I cannot figure out what kind of services you can, you can build. So uh, I guess as a given example, there is in... Uh, in Finland, there is an a application which actually allows you to, to figure out if you can catch the train or not. So it's, it was made by a person which actually he, he built it for his wife because his wife was never able to, to not always catching the train. And knowing when the train comes is not exactly, you know, it's a schedule, but in reality, it's not sure that it will be there. It could be two minutes later, two minutes earlier. But the, the fin Finnish um, train system exposed the APIs where you can actually look where is the train actually, the location of the actual train. And he used it in combination from mobile uh, data from the operator, which also exposed it, plus the GPS location of the phone, and then you can, it could give you the idea that, okay, now if you run a little bit faster, you will actually catch the train. And it's one of the very popular uh, applications there. And I can tell you, I would not even think to do it. So there is always somebody can figure it out some ways, combining all of this, which you would not even think about it. And Edge, it's also one piece where might be some services coming out, very wonderful <laughs> services out of it. So you can run, but you can hide from it. The edge cloud is here now. 
That's all what I have. Thank you. Yeah, questions, actually. Yes, please, questions. So if anybody's interested, the stairs are here for you, and so is the mic. Anything about catching trains? Okay. Who? <laughs> no question. Oh, okay, there is a question. Thank you for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I have actually a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, do this infra infrastructure on the edge, uh, infrastructure requires real-time operating systems already to achieve? Okay. Yes, so if, if you need real-time capabilities on infrastructure. Yeah, I was wondering a little bit more on the software side. Yes, so yes, okay. So. Actually, one of the that very big list which I was showing in the infrastructure, one of the item is real time, and when we talk real time, we we are saying that I will give you value. So between from VM to VM communication inside the same CPU, it must be below 50 microseconds, microseconds, not milliseconds. So yes, it, there is a need to have real time communication to be able to deploy telecommunication equipment on it. Yes, it is needed and it's mandatory basically. And uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you started a um, career as a senior uh, engineer at Nokia. And I was wondering, do you miss anything from <laughs> being a software engineer nowadays? So I didn't start as senior engineer. I, that was how I finished that position. I started oh. as a, it, the, the official name was product expert. And it was a funny name because when I came there, how, how can I be expert in my first day, which I, I don't know anything about anything, so how can I be expert? But that was the position name. It evolved during six or seven years, and then I finished it as a senior engineer. So, no, I don't miss it. Why? Because I'm running on my laptop um, uh, our own cloud infrastructure in a, in a virtual machine. So I do at home a lot of programming. So I, I'm, I try to not disconnect myself from doing real things. So. Yes, I know. Now, nowadays, I, I'm how I'm calling myself PowerPoint paper pusher. Okay, I do a lot of paper pushing around, but I try to also do real things because talking about things is one thing, but when you do it yourself, you learn a lot. So yes, I'm missing it, but I'm not missing it because I'm continuing doing. Don't be fooled. So this is just a show off. So no, I'm doing still real work, not uh, only paper. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions, please? Yes, there's one over there. Uh, hey, I have a uh, question, maybe a little explana more explanation. Uh, at the beginning, I understand this talk is about uh, how it is done in Nokia in base towers and uh, some sort of uh, this approach, like big company have multiple uh, edges to to cover and provide uh, software there to to perform some action like communication with mobiles and etc. And later I understand that uh, when we t when you talk about uh, stadium uh, use case, for example, where there is dedicated on premise their server for video streaming processing and uh, sort. Uh, of this functionality uh, and in between I didn't catch maybe did this did you suggest that there will be some sort of general purpose edge computing node for everybody use but again I think on the other side there is, is some dedicated uh, on-premise servers which don't have uh, use outside this specific location for example so why we need general pur purpose uh, on-premise, on, on, on edge uh, computing uh, solutions. So maybe I didn't catch this, but this is my uh, question. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm not from marketing, so I didn't come and tell you how wonderful the Nokia stuff is. So I didn't, my intent wasn't that. I, I just give you examples of Nokia equipment because I don't know what other examples to give you. So that's why I didn't talk, I talk about you know, requirements in general, how they are fulfilled, and so on. So now when it comes to the infrastructure for dedicated those use cases, that infrastructure is not built for that purpose. 
So the infrastructure which is deployed in a stadium, it's a infrastructure which I, I was telling you that is a, it need to be optimized, means that it need to fit on a small, a small, uh, small uh, footprint, but it provides you all the capabilities which you get from a vanilla OpenStack or vanilla Kubernetes. So you can deploy any application you want as long as you, your application can deal with the vanilla APIs which are available from an OpenStack or Kubernetes infrastructure. So it's not purpose built. And that's the whole point why we consider the edge, it doesn't make economically sense if it's built purposely for only one, one use case. The, the economy, so how can we, uh, the TCO will go down, the total cost of ownership will go down if you use the edge for multiple use cases. So if in that stadium, for example, there is one of the use cases is that stadium, nobody is stopping and actually you should be able to deploy, for example, uh, the, the um, run part, the remote access, uh, radio access network components of a 5G, that is one application. You put it on the same infrastructure on that stadium. Then you deploy on it, for example, the controlling part of a fixed network. You put it also there. You want to put your nice application, which is doing statistics based on people movement on the stadium. You deploy that one as well there. Of course, you need to have capacity to <laughs> put all of this because it's not, the cloud is not infinite how somebody might think of. But no, it's not purpose built. So that was a very good question and good that uh, actually I could say it. Uh, so this, as far as I understand about, uh, after you explain this, this is some sort of uh, computing center, center which is general purpose and we, you can reuse it uh, in your place without uh, any customization because one vendor or other vendor is like open source uh, data center which you can bring in case and put everywhere. Correct. Okay, so yes. it's... That's the idea. Of like course, it's not... Of, of course, you won't find it... I mean, somebody need to build it, somebody need to provide it, and somebody definitely will charge you for it. <laughs> but <laughs> but in the end, yes, it's it's multi-purpose build uh, solution, and that's how it should be. Yep. Uh, hello. Uh, my question, I think you answered it almost, but uh, because you mentioned OpenStack and Kubernetes again when you were uh, answering this question, but I'm wondering... Uh, whether you believe these are the best tools to use uh, also in this edge cloud, edge computing, or maybe th are there some better orchestration uh, systems that are more suited specifically to be used in edge computing instead of generic clouds used everywhere else, especially also when we consider that maybe we would want to run this as a single node application, maybe we don't need all of those um, orchestration systems, what would you use then? Okay, so now I will talk about what we did. Okay, so I will talk from Nokia point of view. So we consider that first of all, OpenStack, Kubernetes, KVM and Docker, they are the mostly used, right? So we decided that, okay, we, you need to make a choice. You cannot you cannot pro make it from everything. So we made a choice. Do you want to deploy VMs? Then we provide you uh, capabilities to deploy VMs on a KVM with OpenStack as a, as a management. And the OpenStack will provide you vanilla APIs. So you don't need to, uh, you, we don't build some specialized APIs. Uh, all is open source. And we don't build uh, specialized APIs because nobody will use them, right? The Kubernetes is the same way. We consider that this is the mostly used and this is what we use. What we did, we do both of these. We optimize them in the way that actually you can have in uh, one server, you can have your, uh, of course, you cannot have in one server currently uh, running KVM and Docker in the same time because there is a resource uh, allocation problem. So, so if you have five servers, you can say, okay, three of them I'm dedicated for KVM, two of them for uh, Docker. And what we did, we actually built what is missing out of the whole uh, community out. We built a middleware system, which provide enhancements to what is meeting, missing. Optimization, uh, lifecycle management APIs, which are missing completely from OpenStack or Kubernetes. Uh, and all, all uh, uh, real-time uh, optimization in the KVM and so on. So we took all these available open source components and we 
we optimize them and then we build uh, separately, we call it middleware, which allows us to deploy uh, telco. W is it good or bad? You are asking, it's, it is something else. Um, it's not us to decide. It is the community who decides what is it. So if community runs on, uh, wants to have Kubernetes and, and, and uh, OpenStack, then be it, there it is. It's not us really to decide. What we only could do is to optimize it, that's it. Lovely, thank you very much for your questions. And Adrian, we wish you in the future, thanking for your great talk, uh, safe scuba diving, safe cave diving, and very successful, hopefully in the future, code diving as well. Yes, yes, Adam, thank you. Adrian Parrott. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, now it's time for the last break of the day, so uh, take your half hour and do show up in this room for the last talk of this year's Code Dive. Thank you.
So welcome to the grand finale of uh, Code Dive 2019 and the last talk is going to be delivered by two speakers, Piotr Gaczkowski and Adrian Ostrowski. But before that, the last Nokia word for you to guess and I'm going to give you a defini definition again and again your task is to uh, remember or guess what the word is and it's a verb and it means literally to throw something out of the window or more in the IT language this is something that you do with a piece of bad code thank you it's to defenestrate you need to explain to me later you know why you, you would ever write such code that is only good for throwing out of the window because I haven't been able to understand that so I will need your help with that later but for the time being let me introduce the speakers uh, Adrian is a modern C++ enthusiast interested in the newest language standards and development of high quality code previously promoting music bands as a member of the board of Compressor Foundation as well as C++ and EPAM as a member of the board for its C++ community. Recently finished working on a commodity exchange trading system currently taking a deep dive into machine learning at this company called Habana. And privately he bakes his own bread but I'm not actually sure how often he eats it. And uh, Piotr, on the other hand, is a music and automation enthusiast. He's focused on efficiency and effectiveness, experienced in management, programming and DevOps, and enjoys building simple solutions to human problems. Occasionally writes IT articles never without headphones around very often wearing sunglasses he loves listening to music especially with friends he practices this extreme sport called parkour and also runs a book club and from time to time Piotr actually eats Adrian's bread and gives him feedback on his baking skills but today they're going to be talking about cloud native C++ modern architecture for modernized language. A round of applause please for Piotr Gaczkowski and Adrian Ostrowski. Okay, hi there people. Uh, I got to get this thing going. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to for choosing uh, this session. Uh, first of all, because it's late in the afternoon and I guess you are all tired. Second of all, because all the other sessions are at least equally interesting and probably uh, maybe even more depending on your interests. Uh, but if you are here, I guess you'll be interested in what we have to say. Uh, as uh, Rafał mentioned, my name is Piotr Gaczkowski uh, and if you want to uh, check out the slides on your mobile device and watch them later. They should be available at the link above. Uh, otherwise, if you're interested to uh, looking for some more info about me, it's listed in here. Since my name is uh, quite unpronounceable to foreigners, I often go by Doomhammer or Doomhammer NG, so that's the way uh, you can find me. And my name is Adrian Ostrowski, and uh, I'm working at this company named Habana, just as Rafa mentioned. It's an AI processor company that uh, creates hardware and some software for this hardware for deep learning, so accelerators for training and inference. Okay, uh, the idea uh, and the deliverables that we want to uh, give you today is that I'll set the stage, I'll do the bit of a warm-up, theoretical warm-up, uh, saying uh, things about cloud native, what it is, what it's good for, and things like that. And after the warm-up, Adrian will take you for a deep cloud dive, code dive in the clouds, uh, uh, showing you how you can use C++ to write cloud native uh, applications. So, uh, first question to you, uh, how many of you have heard the term cloud native? Okay, I see some of you have least heard it. Uh, how many of you knows what it means? 
Okay, a bit less hands, but still it's fine. Uh, yeah, so uh, what is cloud native and why should we care? I'll deliver two definitions uh, for you. Uh, one is uh, the one that I particularly like and use it very often. The other is uh, less funny, I would say, but maybe a bit more straightforward. So cloud native uh, is the 21st century rediscovery of the mind frame. And why should we care? Well, because Google uses it, right? Everything that Google uses has to be good. <sighs> but let's start again. What is cloud native? Cloud native is a, and yeah, I know it sounds like a sales speech and pretty bad one at that, is a vendor agnostic way to deliver scalable and highly available applications. What do you mean by that? Uh, by that I mean that uh, there are several standards on how to write applications uh, focusing mostly on the business logic and not on the stuff that has been already prepared by somebody else. For example, if you're using a public cloud like uh, AWS, GCP, Azure, or whatever else, uh, you also get some abstractions. You get load balancing, for example. You get uh, virtual networking. You get access to on-demand instances, etc., etc., etc. But all of them works in a vendor-locked-in manner. So if you start building an application on one vendor, you cannot easily move to the other. What does it mean for you? Well, it means that when you pass certain point, you will basically be build enormous, uh, enormous bills each month by using this cloud vendor. This happens a lot uh, with uh, some big companies, for example, like uh, Lyft or uh, yeah, the US government. It's also a big company, if I may say so. Uh, so vendor lock-in is a real problem. Uh, and the cloud native approach uh, helps us to use the same set of tools, but without the vendor lock-in. The idea is that those building blocks, those you know, Lego blocks of software architecture, uh, will be open sourced, accessible to anyone. You can run it on any cloud you want. You can run it on your own computer. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, and you also can run it on your phone if you are adventurous enough. Why not? And why should we care? Another, this would sound a bit like a sales speech, but it helps to achieve the business requirements. So uh, it helps to build the application to serve the customers, uh, whoever they are, uh, in a way that minimizes this vendor lock-in. Moving between vendors, between solutions, may thus become easier because they are loosely coupled, not strongly coupled. So. Uh, how did we come to the cloud-native approach? A brief history of application architectures. Uh, it all started with the you know, start of computing. Uh, first of all, there were monolithic applications running on CPU because uh, that's, that's what the computers were for. You have the central processor unit, you have the program that you wrote especially for that computer with that peripherals, uh, you have to uh, handle all the, all the interrupts yourself, you have to handle keyboard teletype, whatever there was uh, on your own. Uh, and it was pretty tedious. So the next, uh, the next step was the introduction of monolithic applications, but running on an operating system. Operating system in this way uh, functioned as a first le abstraction layer. It abstracted the low-level stuff, the drivers, the interrupts, the memory management. Uh, so you could focus on writing the actual application, the actual thing that brings value to the user. And from that point on, uh, this abstraction is uh, constantly evolving. We abstract many other ways. Um, if you have ever used any modern web applications, uh, especially build one, uh, you would probably find out that they consist of 
thousands of various dependencies, each of these dependencies forming another abstraction layer. Uh, so uh, the developers can focus on what's important to them and not solve the problems that have been uh, solved previously by somebody else. After monolithic applications, there came an advent of uh, client-server applications. Uh, so basically, the logic was split between the one fat computer uh, that processed everything and the slightly thinner uh, computers that mainly uh, was featuring the user interface. Still, this wasn't enough. After that, uh, people thought that uh, the client-server model is not suitable to every solution. Um, to every project, to every product. Uh, so uh, service-oriented architecture uh, was developed, or specs, or whatever can you say about the mm, architecture. And there are many different implementations of service-oriented architecture, uh, but most of them uh, assume that we have different services performing different tasks and communicating in one way or the other. Uh, one example would be the enterprise service bus, when we have this bus that uh, processes the messages uh, that we want to uh, input into the system, and different services process those messages, returning the, uh, the answer back to the, uh, to the service bus. Another approach to uh, service-oriented architecture is microservices. And this is the approach uh, we would focus uh, later on, especially uh, this is the part that Adrian will uh, show you how to do in C++ in less than half an hour. Uh, so that's that. Uh, benefits of microservices. Uh, allow microservices allow us easier debugging because uh, when we have services that are micro, which means basically as tiny as possible, there is less code to debug. They do one thing and one thing only. The definition is that they should do it OK. But if anything doesn't work, uh, we have a s rather small surface to look at to search for problems. Uh, then there's better scalability, because those services uh, are usually uh, loosely coupled, and we can just for example, set up 5, 10, 20, or wh wh whatever we, uh, number we want of those services to handle the larger, uh, larger volume of requests. Then there's better resource utilization. Uh, we have, assuming we have three powerful machines, if we have microservices, we can use the resources on those machines uh, that correspond exactly to our needs. If we need more workers, uh, for example, we are serving an airport, and we want to sell more tickets. But we are not necessarily uh, interested in any other services. So we increase the number of microservices that sell tickets, and they just use uh, the whole available computing power. We can also build anti-fragile systems. And uh, for a moment, I would like to pause here. Uh, have any of you here heard the term anti-fragile? Oh, I see one hand, if I'm not blinded by light. OK, uh, so that would be fun to uh, introduce. Mm, normally, we are talking about things that are fragile, that break easily, and things that are sturdy, that don't break easily. But sturdy is not an opposite of fragile. It breaks just the same way as the fragile thing does. It only needs more time or more force to uh, break it. Whereas anti-fragile system is the one that benefits from the stress we put into it. Most natural organic uh, things are anti-fragile. Most uh, things created by humans are either fragile or sturdy. For example, if we have a statue, it's sturdy, but it will break at some point. If we have a human organism, if we cut ourselves, we will heal. If we, uh, if we rip our muscles during the training, they would not only grow back, they would also grow stronger. So that's the example of an anti-fragile system. And we can use it this way 
uh, by leveraging microservices. In fact, that's what Netflix does with uh, their infrastructure. Uh, even creating microservices to cause disruption and to check what is going on after that. Uh, they call this the uh, Chaos Monkey Army, I think, and uh, basically it was the beginning of chaos engineering, which is something that uh, I encourage you to uh, look deeper into. It's an interesting concept. Oh, hi. Uh, another thing, I'm not sure if it's a benefit of uh, microservices, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly one of the features, is state statelessness hard word to pronounce, and statelessness means that we don't carry any state in these microservices. Why is it important? Because the less we have to carry uh, about, if we have to care about state, uh, the less problems we have. We just run our service, we can, uh, you know, uh, cold boot it and it's ready to run. Whatever we do, uh, if, it, if it breaks, then it breaks, right? No problem. Uh, we can set up another one. There is no state we have to uh, persist. It's a feature of microservices, but it's also one of the major headaches because uh, I have never ever seen an application that is truly stateless. Oh, okay. Maybe apart from a calculator, you can write a stateless calculator that whenever you input one and two returns three, but I guess that's as far as you can go. Most other services need some sort of state. And this is kind of a you know, um, shadow zone uh, when it comes to cloud native approach. So everybody knows that cloud native is good. But if you have stateful applications, you have to be careful. So that's that. Uh, a brief history of software deployment strategies. I think this would be uh, even briefer. With uh, monoliths, it is obvious that manual configuration was used because uh, every piece of software was treated like a special snowflake because it was a special snowflake. It was written for this actual, uh, this actual machine. After that, uh, when people started doing more deployments more often uh, and started seeing that this configuration can be automated because there, it makes no sense to do the same set of manual steps each time we, uh, we want to install a piece of software on a given machine, uh, there came automated configuration management. Uh, another, uh, another part in the evolution, at least from my perspective, uh, was the advent of pre-configured virtual machine images. So we wouldn't just uh, get the machine, run some scripts on it to configure whatever the state we need, and then give the application, we would prepare an image that contains configuration, whatever else we need, initial data, the application, and then we only deployed it to the actual system. Uh, it made deployment a lot easier and a bit faster. But virtual machines came with one drawback. And that drawback was, as you may imagine, performance. Since they were virtualized, they needed much more resources than just the application would need. Uh, for example, uh, we would need to boot the kernel, which uh, penalized us with uh, some time to boot it. Also, this kernel uh, would have to use some part of memory. Uh, in most virtual machine environments, we also have to uh, decide upfront how much memory we would like to give to this virtual machine and how much CPU we would like to give to this virtual machine. So scaling was possible, totally, but not very convenient, I would say. But after that, there came containers as a lighter al alternative to virtual machines. So they also use a kind of virtualization, but on the OS level and not on the entire machine level. We have the same kernel, but other than that, everything is contained in a separate, well, container. Uh, and a quiz for you. I have, uh, unfortunately, uh, no gifts for you. Uh, if you know the correct answer, I can give you a bottle of water if you want. Uh, do you know where, where does the name containers come from uh, in terms of uh, the, yeah, 
application containers that we are speaking of. Anybody has a clue? OK, so just as the shipping containers that you see here uh, revolutionized the modern transport and logistics, because suddenly there was only one thing uh, you have to worry about, the same happens now to software development, application development. Uh, containers give us the means to develop applications in whatever technology we like, but we still have the same way to uh, run them, to configure them, to interface with them. So that's, that's really convenient. Uh, yeah. Imagine, imagine how, uh, how a shipping port looked like before the advent of containers. Each ship was different, each had a different cargo, you would have to move all those cargo to different places. And yeah, until recently, the same was with applications. The Java application required totally different approach to deploy than a C++ application. C++ application was something totally different to Python and to JavaScript and to whatever other technology there is in the world. So you have to have a deployment uh, team f that was uh, skilled in each of the technologies used by the projects. And there could be many of them. So the benefits of containers are small overhead, as I said, standard interface, configuration bundled with an application, so we don't have to configure anything uh, on top of that. We can build, test, deploy to production the exact same image. So it's no longer, uh, you know, works on my computer. If it works on your computer, there are high chances it would work everywhere else. And there is a common interface for all the technologies. So when you put containers and microservices together, because you can use them separately, uh, you gain some cool things because they complement each other. And they both form the basis for a cloud-native approach. Uh, in cloud-native, uh, we are mostly focused on containerized applications. We are mostly focused on microservices. So, uh, cloud native approach uh, uses a stand uses a set of standard interfaces to some common problems. As I said, the problems are listed. I won't go over that uh, because there's not much sense. Uh, that's 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 why it's worth uh, interesting uh, getting interested in. If you have any of those problems, maybe maybe a cloud native approach may be, uh, might be a good solution to that. But not necessarily. And cloud native is mostly connected to Kubernetes. You might have heard them, you know, like in a tandem, uh, both mentioned at the same time. But there are other uh, projects, for example, Prometheus, Envoy, that we'll uh, come to in a moment, Core DNS, other other things like that. They all have their uh, their use cases for cloud native applications. For example, FluentD helps with uh, creating a unified logging layer. Uh, Jaeger helps with distributed tracing, so uh, getting data from different parts of the system and connecting them together, uh, looking at performance of each application and what goes on uh, in our services. But a part of those uh, projects that I mentioned. There are also 15 incubating CNCF uh, projects at the time. There are 20 sandbox CNCF projects. CNCF is a cloud native computing foundation, I forgot to add. Uh, and the entire cloud native computing foundation portfolio consists of like uh, 1,300 projects around uh, with a market capitalization of enormous amount of dollars and funding of enormous amount of dollars. So it's definitely something to uh, to be watching for because, uh, well, it's no longer that just Google uses it. I'm not saying that this is a reason you should jump into it, but watching it, I definitely, uh, I definitely uh, can tell you to do it. So back to the mainframe. Why is cloud native better than just getting 
IBM Zs and using them. Oh, by the way, uh, I was recently looking at uh, some cloud native and mainframe comparisons, and uh, I realized that IBM actually advertises it, its Z series mainframes as a gateway to cloud native. So I'm not sure. They're endorsing cloud native on mainframes. That's something uh, I couldn't have imagined because uh, I consider mainframes to be a relic of, you know, 50s or something like that. Yes, so uh, back to the point. Uh, why is cloud native better? You don't have to learn COBOL to write cloud native applications. That's, for me, a very good reason. Uh, you can use C++. That's another good reason, because many people here use C++ on a daily basis, so uh, you are already equipped to uh, write cloud-native applications. And you can use a modern C++ as well use, uh, with cloud-native applications. Actually, it's quite easy, as Adrian in a moment will show you. So uh, thank you for uh, keeping with me here uh, on this cloud-native introduction. Now, let's go for an actual code dive with Adrian, who will take you to the clouds and beyond. OK, so let's dive deep into the meat and let's make a microservice. So what do we actually need to create one? So we need some ingredients and we need some infrastructure, both of which are on this picture. And the ingredients would be the core application, and uh, it should contain mostly, I mean, at best, it should only have the core business logic and some communication uh, software components. So let's create a simple generator for code names just like the Ubuntu system has. So for example, the precise pangolin. And it's always an adjective plus an animal name. And our microservice we will accept uh, an input, which is a single letter, the first letter of the name. And uh, it will output the, just the code name. So a possible output for the letter P would be pretty big. And uh, that's actually one of the proposals that uh, st it stays on Ubuntu's wiki page for 12.04. Maybe they will reuse it when they come to another P-named uh, release. And for communication, we can, for interfacing with the outside world, we can use the C++ REST SDK, which is well tested in battle. It's a Microsoft created uh, library that uh, uses, that is able to create HTTP requests and responses for sending JSON messages. So how would our code, how can, I, how, how can our code look like? And uh, here's an example. So we have a simple function to handle the incoming HTTP requests. What we are doing is we are just extracting the parameter. That is the simple letter. And if it's, if it's not there, we can return an HTTP bad request error code with a error message. And if the letter is there, then we can just generate the code name and pack it in our reply that says HTTP OK, 1200, 200. So let's see how the respond function looks like. And uh, this is really a simple function. It just gets the, the code and the, the return string and it packs them in, a, in JSON and then uses the incoming request to reply to it. And our main function is also pretty simple. So we just create an endpoint. We are listening on every socket for the name, on the ge name generator. Uh, and once we open the socket, we want to listen just for GET requests, so we register just for that. Then there would come some code to wait the listening and close the application. So yeah, so we created the application, but are we there yet? Is this already a microservice? Is this all that you're going to need? 
and probably not because however this works however rest isn't the most performant choice so if you're decided if you've decided to write your microservice in c++ chances are you want to use something faster you don't have time to use rest so what can you use instead and one of the technologies that is becoming really popular and i think it's a is a good choice is grpc and this is a framework that is actually being developed as part of the cncf that piotr mentioned and uh, it has several benefits just like rest it allows us to easily communicate with software written in other languages so you can write other microservices in java python ruby c sharp or even javascript and they could communicate using grpc it's blazing fast and underneath it uses uh, a chosen by you payload mm, container so it could be by default it's protocol buffers and this is i think what you're going to use uh, there are other options but this one is the best tested <coughs> excuse me and it's uh, pretty performant as well mm, so let's see how the definition of our service in grpc look like and this is uh this is basically the same service that we had in rest so as we could see it's just a simple definition we have a service name generate code name and uh, it, c it accepts a request which we define just below the, the the service and then it says it returns a response and we also define the response so unfortunately grpc or the, the um, pro protobufs don't support single characters so we're going to use a string as a letter but I think it's not that a uh, common problem to pass a single character to a microservice. Usually you pass something more. So let's see how we could use it. So, so using, this, uh, using the tools that uh, the pro proto compiler and the gRPC, we can generate uh, lots of code that we can just use either to create a client for the service or to create a service interface that we later need to implement. So this is how we could implement our name generator service. We just inherit from this interface and uh, we create our name generator class. It has a function which is the same name that we saw on the previous slide. It's, uh, it's really simple and it accepts uh, the request and either returns the, res the correct response or a status code that could indicate an error. And first we check if the input is valid. I'll save you that. And if it's not, we just return an invalid argument. It will get translated. So, so it's, it's translated to another error code underneath, but let's leave it for that. And then it's, uh, it's if, if the input is okay, we just generate the code name using the input set the reply field and uh, return a default OK value. So now our main function could look like this. It's also pretty simple. We just create our name generator service and then create a builder for the server in which we register our service and say that it has to listen on the given port and we just start to listen and wait. So we have now this great performant gRPC service, but th there is an issue because we already deployed our REST version before. So now we have to support it, right? Some folks are, are already using it. So should we now care about two versions and co-develop them in parallel? I think that's not the best approach. And uh, there is a simple way to solve it even without touching code. So let's move from the first ingredient, which was code, to the second one, which is infrastructure. 
And what we really need is, is an envoy to proxy between the REST interface and our new performance gRPC service. And let's focus on those two words here, envoy proxy. So it turns out there already is something like this. It's Envoy that was mentioned by Piotr. And it's a library that was created by Lyft for cloud native applications. It's an open, it's open source in CNCF. So it's a CNCF pro project, just like it was said before. It's high performant. It's all written in C++. And uh, it can work well both for standalone applications or services and for big service meshes. So if you want to create some bigger infrastructure with, say, Kubernetes or Istio, it's also uh, an excellent choice. But what exactly is Envoy? So what you can see on this image is a sidecar, and that's exactly what Envoy is. It's uh, an example of the sidecar proxy pattern. So just like you put a sidecar, attach it to your motorbike, to give the motorbike extra functions, like more stability, more seats, the same way you can deploy Envoy and let it attach to your application. Oh, and by the way, the name of this picture is Lovely Combination, which I think is a pretty accurate name for combining both the sidecars to your motorcycles and to your software. So if you deploy them on your host, on your con let's say in, your, in a container or wherever you choose. You have only those two components. You have the application that can now focus only on interfacing with the sidecar and writing its business logic. And the sidecar pattern, let's say an Envoy instance, one for each instance of your application, can interact with both the app and the outside world. So it can provide you with uh, features like automatic configuration, service discovery, and lots of more. And this is great for you as an application developer because it means you don't need to implement those in your application. So it gets lots simpler. You don't have dependencies. You don't depend on libraries or any libraries that your libraries depend on. And uh, Envoy has uh, a good, w one good thing about Envoy is that in comparison to some Netflix services, in Netflix, you have to somehow integrate those in your application. So oftentimes you need to rebuild your application when you update one of those Netflix components. And with Envoy, it's a totally different binary. It just communicates with it. So if you update Envoy, your application can stay the same. You don't need to rebuild it. OK, so let's now get back to our core problem and see how we can use Envoy as a bridge between our two services. And this is done using Envoy's configuration files. I think this is pretty easy and convenient, although it can seem a bit verbose at first. So Envoy basically has this concept of those filter chains, which is just a set of filters that do things with the incoming and, outgo and outgoing traffic. So we have the HTTP connection manager filter, and this is exactly what provides us with a REST endpoint. And then we have to create a route that the traffic that goes through this filter will, will go to. And what we are going to do is we are going to route all incoming traffic, regardless of the domain written in the HTTP request, to our cluster. And this is the other part of that config. So let's name that cluster gRPC service. It will be a pretty simple one. And here you can see its definition. We have some timeouts for connections. We can set some load balancing or not. Round robin is the fine, simple default that tends to work. Not that others don't. Uh, and uh, 
our cluster is defined like this. So we have to define all the endpoints that go into this cluster. We can have multiple instances either on the local host or somewhere nearby. OK, and this just works. So now we have a bridge. But is that all? Do we have a complete microservice now? Some of you could say yes, but microservices usually require more than just some infrastructure and some core logic. I mean, th this many infrastructure that we already had. So one of the most common issues with network architecture, distributed architecture, is that you need to somehow sometimes handle lots of incoming load through the network. So lots of things can go bad, and you need to wait oftentimes for incoming replies to the requests that you're sending. And uh, microservices like to make lots of code calls to other microservices. And what should we do when the service that we are calling is busy or doesn't respond in a timely manner? If it just crashed, it's simple, right? We connect to it, we get a connection refused, so we know it's down. The worst case is when it still works, but it takes seconds to complete a request, and thousands of them at that. So those long waits could cascade not only to us as a caller of the service, but also to other services that called us. And this is really tragic for our whole architecture. And the solution to this is to use this pattern named circuit breaking, breaker. And circuit breaking is basically to detect if a service fails to complete requests and then assume it's down and just short circuit, so stop waiting for the replies and just return an error immediately. So how do we do it in Envoy? And it's also pretty simple. So we have the circuit breakers section that we can add to the clusters definition. We can prioritize some traffic and set different policies for different priorities. So in this example, we can define the max connections parameter, which is for HTTP 1.1 connections. Then we have HTTP 2, which is also supported by Envoys, and this is steered by max requests. And also, there's this third max pending request that serves as a, well, just as, it's, just as it name suggests, it's for pending requests. And uh, Envoy, unfortunately, doesn't provide us with an option to break on latency in the circuit breaker. But fortunately, it has another feature that can help us with this. And this, un this other feature is automatic retries. So its main purpose is to ba just retry the request if we got an internal issue with the called service. So sometimes the service just services just hiccup and it makes sense to retry the request. And we can configure what error codes we would like to retry the service request on, how many time we want to spend per each request, and how many of those retries should we do. So even though you see the 500 HTTP code here, it will work for our gRPC request as well, because there is a translation mechanism. So most of the gRPC failures will be retried if you, say, set the config like so. And if per request timeouts is not what suits you, you can also or instead set a global timeout for all the requests. Another feature that you could find handy if you want to have microservices in production are incremental blue-green deploys. Basically, a blue-green deploy is when you have two environments and you switch between them. So you deploy a newer version to, of your application to one of them and then switch it to production. If anything goes bad, you can, also, you can always switch back to the working previous version. With incremental deploys like, like those, you can gradually switch. So first you can 
just deploy your application and start it and see if it doesn't crash. Then you can slowly start putting more and more traffic into it and observe how it behaves. Can it handle the load? Doesn't it, if doesn't, does it crash or not? And it's pretty easy to do with Envoy as well. So here for our name generator, we can just set a route that will move some traffic to the new version of the application. So here it's 5% of the traffic. And for the previous working version, 95%. And we can gradually increment this to 15, 50, and eventually 100. And uh, is that all that Envoy can do for us? And it turns out it's not. It's actually a bigger beast. So one of the cool features that it also offers is service discovery. It can look for other microservices for us that we want to call. It can configure our application dynamically. So you, just, you can just either remotely connect to the admin panel of Envoy and set some parameters or modify the config file and it should go live once you save it. Another feature is load balancing. So we already saw that round robin policy. And uh, I will, I'm not yet another one is health checking. So we can either check if the cluster as a whole is healthy and processes requests well, or if there is maybe one instance in this cluster that behaves badly, and this is the outlier that we should remove. Another feature is back pressure. So this is mostly useful when your uh, microservice is under heavy load. You can just return an error code early to not call the service at all and let it have some space to breathe. Mm -hmm. Yet another feature that Envoy offers us are tracing capabilities, and it can really well gather statistics and logs along your clusters and aggregate them along your services, along routes and nodes. And um, yet another one is request shadowing, and this one is interesting because sometimes you just want to grab some traffic from production and send it to your test environment to see how your test environment could behave. And this is what request shadowing exactly does. So you can either send, send all the traffic that you've got or just parts of it, and it just works. And also Envoy can be used to configure SSL and TLS between your services or just as an entry point to your architecture, to your system. So it can terminate the user connections, the TLS connections coming in, in, into you. And um, it turns out that Envoy as a sidecar really does provide many, many features that you could find useful as a developer. And instead of baking all of those in your core application, you can just focus on writing some simple config files and the core functionality in C++. And it turns out that basically to create a microservice, all you need is C++ because you have your service in C++, gRPC and protobuf are also written in C++, Envoy is, so basically your whole software stack could be in this technology. And if you're into heterogeneous deployments, you can just as easily communicate with other microservices written in different languages using this approach. And uh, since you, th th this could give you smaller containers because you don't need to, let's say, pack the entire JVM or whatever you want to pack there. And it also gives you C++'s performance. And with that, I think we are ready for some questions. 
as ever towards the end of a talk. So anybody, please, stairs, microphone, questions. I'm going to wait for, for wait Guys, for not all at once. Very long time. There were two people, so you should theoretically <laughs> ask the double number of questions. Nah, everything was clear. <laughs> Well, if you have any questions, you can always come to us later. And you can ask us even about our hobbies if you like to. <laughs> I can give you recipes for making bread. And yeah. also if you're... <laughs> okay then, yes. A round of applause, please. Piotr Gaczkowski, Adrian you. Ostrowski, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Towards the end of every code dive, I, I approach the uh, core team and I ask, you know, can I announce that there's going to be the next code dive next year? And they always tell me the same thing. It's like, you know, nothing is done until it's done, but there is no reason why there shouldn't be the code dive next year. So it apparently is the same this year. There is no reason why there shouldn't be uh, our next code dive and this will be edition number seven in 2020. So in case you were wondering how it was done, there were almost 17 or over 1700 people who signed up for this conference this year and on top of that there were people watching online. There was a, a crew of 17 hosts and volunteers handling the event over those two days and it was prepared by the core team of only four people who worked uh, almost the whole year, almost full time. They spent hours, uh, tens of hours in meetings. They wrote and answered thousands of emails. And I can see two of them over there. They're so tired, so I'm not sure if they'll be able to climb the stairs, but let's ask them. and some volunteers. So let me tell you, without these people here, this conference wouldn't be possible, and uh, they've put enormous effort uh, into preparing the whole thing. So what we've got over the, those two days is just the tip of the iceberg, and their work was uh, huge. So I think 30 seconds, would a 30 second apl applause be nice? I'll time you guys. On my count, and go! Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, do watch this space because uh, no Code Dive 2020 is coming. My name is Rafał Motriuk. It's always been a pleasure and a privilege to be your host. And well, thank you. See you again next year. This was Code Dive 2019. Thank you.